I don't think we're turning a corner until the market knows that we have definitively avoided a recession. The Fed has a really still a clear and present danger on inflation and they've been behind the curve. I think we might still see some upside surprises in inflation. We're really trying to digest what the Federal Reserve is telling us. The least resistance from here is still tighter financial conditions. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Equity futures up a half of 1%. TK trying to do something we couldn't do yesterday. Hold on to these gains. Well, hold on to the gains. We did not do it yesterday. The VIX 27.03 has worked down another notch, John. But what I would say, the unspoken story this morning is now oil lifts. It's up 6.5% off the bottom, according to Commerce Bank, and it's got a further lift in the last hour. Brent crude, 117 a barrel, is not where we were a week ago. TK comes down to one place, one word, one country, China, <laughs> at the epicenter of NATO talks in Madrid today and through the next couple of days, and at the epicenter of some of this price action, too. Admiral Stravitas to join us here. Thrilled about that, and there are a lot to talk about, including Turkey, uh, Sweden, and Finland. But, but John, the China story to me is, is it's in the headlines. It's in the zeitgeist. They're really trying to reopen, aren't they? I'll get excited when they get rid of the quarantine. Yeah. Ramo, I... Easing the quarantine is very different to getting rid of the quarantine. Yeah. Yeah, they're going from, what, 14 days to 10 days or seven, 21 days seven, to yeah. 14 days. I mean, this isn't... you got to get this tested isn't, every three hours. Right. I mean, this isn't a removal of the zero COVID policies. This is a temporary reprieve that can at least alleviate some of the pressure from the demand side. In other words, actually help uh, support global growth. How long it will last, how much uncertainty this just casts into the global demand and supply picture of oil remains to be seen. The earnings backdrop, too. Look at Nike. Yes. No clue what China is going to do for some of these earnings for the rest of this year. And how much of a hit they took from their China business. I mean, what are these companies going to do with both the strategic issues or whatever NATO is phrasing, some of their concerns about China, paired with the lockdowns that are intermittent in China? How does a U.S. company deal with that when they're facing off John, against I, a lot of these politicians, too? I, I think we've got to be mixed on this. Nike gets the headlines today. I get that. But I noticed the other day HSBC went on, along on luxury. I mean, they said luxury is booming worldwide. So maybe it's a mixed picture like we saw with FedEx last week. Did you hear from Lisa Shallot of Morgan Stanley yesterday? I have to say, Tom, she was scathing about earnings estimates at the analyst level for single names. Uh, yeah. Where are the downgrades? That's yeah. what a lot of people are asking. Where are the downgrades well, to earnings this year? Well, you were on sabbatical, John. We did a lot on Reg FD and how the world changed when, when the government said to the sell side, you're in the timeout chair if you uh, get free information or information ahead. Uh, but the answer is, yeah, there's a delay here. Uh, Lisa's right about that. We did speak to her while you were gone, John. Thank you, Tom. How did that go? It was good. It was very informative, actually. Good. It's good to know. You have it to share this with me you know. at a time, and then, you know, we can build on that when I next speak to we her. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Future's positive, a half of 1%. And that took you two minutes and How about 30 seconds, How is that Italian lira today? Let's two minutes look. and about 30 seconds in before you bring up my vacation. Do you know what the boss said to me this morning? I thought you weren't coming back. And I said, if you need a Southern Italian correspondent, I'm <clears> available <throat> two hits a week. He said, Tom, that I need a pay cut. Two hits a week. Do you want I, to be the Southern correspondent John, with me in I Italy? Just see would that the work three out? Of us, I that see would be us, good. The three of us on the Grand Canal in Venice, I think it could work. To do a 30 minute daily show, Tom. Yeah. Let's work it out. NASDAQ futures <laughs> positive four tenths of 1%. Yields up three basis points. A 10 year Lisa, 323 19. I feel like I've just been part of something and I'm not fully uh, clear on the implications. I want an here, auction you know, update. I'll let you know. Right? I want I'll a brief you know. auction brief. <laughs> oh, actually, we do have an auction brief and it's really good. But let's start here. 9 a.m., we get the SP CoreLogic Case Shiller 20 uh, City Home Price Index. We've known that home prices have been climbing at a record pace. We are expecting a deceleration, but will it be enough? to really puncture some of the inflationary inputs, especially as they translate into rent, considering that the housing market lags behind or sort of leads, I should say, the rental market by quite a big margin. 10 a.m., Conference Board's June consumer confidence data comes out. This has been one of the biggest debate among, debates among economists. You have consumer sentiment, that's University of Michigan consumer sentiment, falling off a cliff, and you have uh, consumer confidence from the conf uh, conference board that's hanging in there. 
What's the difference, right? And some people point to one of them if they want to point the bearish case, and the other ones point to the other one if they want to point to the bullish case. The issue is that consumer sentiment from the University of Michigan has to do, and it takes into account oil prices, is more sensitive to that. So we expect have a big debate about how important that is in terms of longer-term inflation expectations. And here's the big one, Tom. 1 p.m., the U.S. is planning to sell $40 billion of seven-year notes. I just want to say yesterday's five-year note sale was really exciting. I mean, not in a good way, but it was one of the worst performances on a bid-ask spread why? going back to 2010. The reason why the seven years is particularly interesting, John, is first of all, it's always volatile, right? And second of all, seven-year notes are not as liquid as 10-year notes. And I point to this chart of the idea that you've seen a deeply inverted curve for quite a while, where basically seven-year yields are higher than 10-year yields. It's a liquidity issue at a time when liquidity is of utmost concern with the Fed pulling back. I think you sold that really well, Bramo. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. I'm not sure if TK sold. I nodded off. No. You know. You still with us, <laughs> Brian's here to I save us. I nodded off. Brian Levitt joins us now. Team is outstanding today. Global <laughs> well, market too, strategist Tom. at Invesco. <laughs> Lisa's going to have words with you in a few more minutes. <laughs> uh, Brian, let's start here with City. They came out and they cut their outlook to 4,200 from 4,700. They still see some upside. And here's the line from the team over there. Better than feared earnings and signs of peaking rates combined with bearish investor positioning support a positive second half risk reward set up. Do you agree with any of that, Brian? I think it's going to be a challenge. I mean, look, there's the volatility is likely to persist as long as there's policy uncertainty. And, it, you know, we've seen valuations come down, which is a positive thing. The question is now on earnings. And, you know, the market's expecting around 220 peak earnings. The economy slows down, then that's going to have to come down as well. So I don't think that the market market's already down, but peaked to trough 24 percent. I don't think we have a substantial amount of, of downside here, but certainly will be challenging to sustain. Um, you know, you'd have to think, what's the catalyst? You'd need to see inflationary pressure start to come down um, in order for the market to get a better bid here. Brian, how can Fed language change your world? If all the different Fed speakers come out, yep, 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 up to July 27th, how do they adjust our expectations simply of what to do with our money? <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, we're, we're still in this don't fight the Fed type of environment. Now, the good news is the, the two-year rates has priced in a significant amount of tightening. The question is how much further would we have to go beyond that. Um, goods inflation looks like it's going to start to come down. Some of the industrial commodities have come down pretty significantly. Um, and we'll need to see, you know, some alleviation of pressure in the service economy. If inflation starts to roll over, albeit from a very high level, the market's going to care more about the direction of that. The Federal Reserve starts to get more comfort that inflationary pressures are coming down. It's going to be a, a positive for these markets. What do you think, Brian, of this theory that inventories are actually going to be overstocked and we're going to get to a whipsaw kind of environment where suddenly there will be a big disinflationary push that will cause the Fed to reverse course within the next 12 months? Do you buy into that theory that a lot of people are looking to? Well, there's certainly a chance at that. If you, if you speak to people, you speak to people in logis logistics or storage or trucking, and they say this is going to be an oversupply economy. Um, that was our view before Russia went into Ukraine. We thought inflationary pressures were going to moderate this year because demand was starting to slow and businesses were working feverishly to, to rebuild inventories. So there is a chance, particularly on the good side, that you, well, obviously on the good side, that you will see an oversupplied economy. The question is, do the inflationary pressures come down fast enough in order to give the Fed comfort? Look, I don't think that we're in a world now where inflationary pressures are going to be elevated. We know they're going to come down as the economy slows and, and businesses are working to rebuild the inventory. The question now is more of timing and when does the Federal Reserve feel comfortable that, um, that, they've been, that we've accomplished this. And how much damage is done in between, Brian? Ultimately, given the guidance you've heard from this Federal Reserve so far, do you see a commitment to being late and ultimately as being late, the damage is done, it's too late? Well, the policy mistake has already been made. You know, we say that cycles tend to end with policy mistakes. So the policy mistake was already made. Um, can they back off? It's going to be a challenge. Um, so the risks to the cycle are elevated. There is a path to a soft landing. It's, it's perhaps narrower than um, 
than many of us would want it to be. But I think what's important for investors to know, if you look at the last nine recessions, and that's just assuming we have one, if you look at the last nine recessions, the average return peak to trough for the market is negative 30%. We already did 24. Now that's cold comfort to say we've only done what, you know, three fourths of it or a little bit more than three fourths of it. But nonetheless, a lot of the move has happened. So for investors to get overly bearish here, um, the, you know, the, the timing is, is likely to be a bit off. Brian, good to catch up as always. Brian Levitt there of Invesco on the latest in this equity market, where he sees us going and ultimately what the Fed has to do. This came from Marko Kalanovic of JP Morgan yesterday, right on cue. Yep. In line with their mid-year outlook that we saw at the back end of last week, the words as follows. So it's not that we think the world and economies are in great shape, but just that the average investor expects an economic disaster. And if that does not materialise, risky asset classes could recover most of their losses from the first half. I have to say, Tom, my number one question for Marco this morning, and I think other people share this question too. Who's the average investor? How do you gauge that the average investor well, expects an economic disaster? And based on where this market is right now, is that what we see priced anywhere? I, I think there's a fair amount of gloom out there. I mean, we can all gauge it ourselves. And, you know, I, I mean, talk of gloom. I mean, you and I had our ties off yesterday. That was gloomy uh, in its own. But to his defense, what he's talking about is persistency of cash flow in that even given challenges to the economy, as Brian Levitt just outlined, companies keep doing what they do, which is profit. Maybe the margins with you, come Tom. in. I'm with but you. But they profit, and they buy back shares, and they raise dividends, and they do things. It's not for me to question the year-end forecast. I let other people do that. But I am here to interrogate the process. And the process, Lisa, doesn't quite stack up Massive uncertainty. to me at the moment. Another way of asking the same question is, are at risk assets even pricing in recession? We don't even know because we don't even know what the contours of a recession would look like. We don't have any clue. The lack of visibility also is going to lead all those companies with that cash flow to have a real difficulty knowing where to put it. These are some of the concerns underpinning this difficulty putting down what, what catastrophic scenario people are actually pricing in. Concerning times. Do you want some inspiration? Please. From President Lagarde quoting Leonardo da Vinci really? this morning. Every obstacle yields to stern resolve. Do you feel better? <laughs> Do you feel better? Yeah, oh my God. I, like da Vinci song. was great. I thought like he was Love great at Glastonbury. Sarcasm. He was awesome. Yeah, he was, he was awesome. great at Glastonbury. He opened up and then Greta did a speech. It was fantastic to see Tom. Yeah. Features up four tenths from New York. He's on like before Super Bowl. <laughs> this is Bloomberg. <laughs> Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with The First Word, I'm Ritika Gupta. China has made the biggest shift yet in its tough COVID-0 policy. Quarantine times for inbound travelers have been reduced by half from 14 days to seven. That comes after Beijing and Shanghai said they had no new locally transmitted COVID infections for the first time since February. European Central Bank President Christine Lagarde is promising to be nimble. She's a firm plans for a quarter point increase in interest rates next month. But Lagarde said policymakers are ready to step up action if needed to fight that record inflation. And runaway food inflation may be tamed soon, at least temporarily. Farm commodities have been falling after a surge that pushed up the price of everything from bread to chicken wings. The Bloomberg Agriculture Spot sub-index is on track for its biggest monthly drop since 2011. Fear of grain shortages is giving way to optimism that key producers will reap huge harvests. And in San Antonio, Texas, 46 people were found dead in a semi-trailer, apparently the victims of heat strokes. Another 16 were taken to hospitals. Authorities suspect they were migrants. Texas has seen a surge in immigration over its border with Mexico in recent years. Smugglers sometimes use commercial trucks to bring over migrants. In the UK, Prime Minister Boris Johnson's bill to override the Brexit deal survived a challenge in Parliament from members of his own Conservative Party. It now goes to the next legislative step. The bill would allow the UK to unilaterally amend the post-Brexit settlement for Northern Ireland. That could lead to a trade war with the European Union. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. The Boston Pops Firework Spectacular is back in Boston. And Bloomberg will make sure you don't miss a second of the fireworks, music, and special appearances by superstar Shaka Khan, Grammy and Tony winner Heather Headley, and the voice winner Javier Colon. 
plus Middlesex Fife and Drum and the Tanglewood Festival Chorus. It all starts July 4th at 8 p.m. Eastern, right here on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Inflation in the euro area is undesirably high and it is projected to stay that way for some time to come. In July, we intend to raise our policy rates for the first time in 11 years. First thing I read this morning, that was President Lagarde. Actually, a really interesting speech called Challenges for Monetary Policy in a Rapidly Changing World. A little bit more on that a little bit later. From New York City, this is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Lisa Bramberts and Jonathan Farrow. Futures positive about four-tenths of 1% on the S&P. The euro just a little bit stronger. Muted price action there on euro dollar, 105 89 and in the bond market yields just a little bit higher top up three or four basis points to 323.57 interesting time john i'm going to really focus on brent crude six dollars away from west texas intermediate john up two percent 117.33 that's different than a few days ago is that it? the china factor do you think tom Cutting the quarantine, uh, open the door to yeah, loosening I things think, up a little bit. I, I think it is a global demand issue. Certainly, J.P. Morgan and Christian Malik have really emphasized Pacific Rim and emerging market uh, demand as part of that. But maybe it's the mix that we're in uh, right now. In the international mix, our, Mar our Maria Tadeo is in Madrid. She will join us, uh, we hope, in a bit. Anne-Marie Horton right now in Germany on the Austrian border. I believe they call it Bavaria and joins us uh, this morning. Maria, I want to go to Steve Peoples, uh, excuse me, Anne Maria, I want to go to Steve Peoples and Aaron Kessler writing for the Associated Press of the stunning one million registered voters moving from Democrat to GOP, many of them in the suburbs as well. Does the White House, does the Democratic Party apparatus really care about these G7 meetings or are they riveted on the midterm elections mm. back in America? Well, all politics is local, right, Tom? So if you have the president here, he's going to make sure that he has a domestic voice or angle when he goes back. Uh, obviously, though, this is part of being the president of the United States. You have to take part in this global diplomacy. But I would say even here at the G7, while the Russians' invasion of Ukraine, this war in Ukraine has really loomed large, also, for all of these leaders, including the president, it's that angst back home and what you're alluding to. The president yeah. is under immense pressure. Poll after poll shows that inflation is what dominates the minds of Americans. And it's the reason why they're talking about some of these issues, like price caps, so they can keep more fossil fuels, Russian oil and gas on the okay. market, and ease those inflationary concerns, okay, well, because they're all dealing with great. it. Great. America wants a price gap on six, uh, get, gap, uh, cap rather, on $6 a gallon gasoline as well. Please explain how a price cap works. The microeconomics of it befuddles me. I just, I, I, I'm not aware how that mechanism would work. Well, it's never been done before. Exactly. If it has, it probably would have been used to keep <clears throat> Iranian crude on the market, to keep Venezuelan crude on the market. This is completely new, but it has the push from the likes of Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, who yesterday was working the phones in Washington, D.C., to get others on board for this. What it would do, and it could be very complicated, because you have to get shippers involved, insurance companies involved, the buyers involved. Also, not to mention, Russia would need to agree to be willing to sell at a lower price that's closer to their production figures. That's what they want to do. They want to sell to Russia how much it takes to cost to make Russian gas or to make Russian crude is how much they sell it for. So President Putin is not benefiting from these high prices, which he has. $20 billion last month. That is how much the Kremlin brought in from exporting fossil fuels. Hey, Mace, can we talk about the theater? in Bavaria and can you explain to me what Emmanuel Macron was up to when it was pretty obvious the cameras were on him and the president it was pretty obvious people could hear him and he was breaking down a phone call that he'd had with Middle Eastern partners about how much spare capacity was available in the crude market what was he doing He wanted to get the president's attention, I imagine, and this has been a bit of phone tag. So he is relaying a conversation, Emmanuel Macron, that he had with Mohammed bin Zayed, the ruler of the UAE. And what Macron said to President Biden was, one, 
that the UAE is at maximum capacity in terms of how much per production they have of oil, and that Mohammed bin Zayed relayed to Macron what Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, said to him, was that they can only add about 150,000 barrels a day, maybe a bit more. So you can see why there's a lot of phone tag in here. Now, promptly after this had become a public, uh, thanks to the capturing this of Reuters TV, you had the UAE energy minister come out and say, I want to clarify these recent media reports. We are at maximum capacity when it comes to our deal with OPEC, because many believe that there's still some spare capacity left in the United Arab Emirates and much more than 150,000 uh, barrels at the kingdom. But Macron does know that President Biden is going to make this inaugural trip to Saudi Arabia, and part of that is to be asking for some more oil. Anne-Marie. Thank you, AMH in Bavaria, Germany, for the G7. Heading to Madrid, no doubt, later this evening to catch up with foreign leaders over in Madrid for the NATO summit. Bramo, can you make sense of what's going on here? The French leader explaining to the American president on camera where he thinks things are heading just before the president heads over, potentially to tap the shoulder of the Saudis and ask them to do more. No idea. Maybe trying to feel relevant ahead of this and trying to make exactly. sure he has a big stage. I mean, uh, Emmanuel Macron has tried to take a leadership role at a time when they're kind of, I don't want to say as a leadership vacuum, but it's more up for grabs, both European and globally. So how much is he trying to sort of jockey as some sort of importance? To me, that is interesting. I also, with the NATO thing, how interested are you in what they say about China? Fascinated. I mean, did you hear about China being a systemic challenge? Yeah. What does that mean? I think the former president has a lot to say about everything they're about to say at the, at the NATO summit tomorrow. Isn't this straight out of the Trump administration, the script they're about to read? Except on China, yeah. on spending, all of the above. Yeah, although perhaps just a touch more polite and filtered yes. through I, words the, the that difference are not here, Lisa, trying to save a rattle. It. The difference here is that the former president could not form a consensus on those issues, and now That's in his absence, that consensus it. has been formed. Are we done? We're done. I think we're done. Feature's yeah, positive. That, that, that was uh, brilliant. That Thanks. looks just like On the S&P. Look, my default is to get to the market, so let's get <laughs> to the market. Check when in doubt, do a data check. And that's that 100 up 52. We're up four tenths of 1%. You know, China in the mix here, TK. Yeah, China's in the mix. I mean, Lisa, let's be honest. I mean, for those of you on radio, you don't get the full glimmer. Can we just be clear, Lisa, that John looks tanned and rested? <laughs> You're still bitter about this? I'm not so when bitter. When do you get vacation? He's so, observing. so bitter. You know, we'll send you away for a weekend. I was wearing Factor 30. Go to the Catskills. Very well protected. Yeah, yeah. This is just a golden glow. Effortless. I think they're all completely, really. John, I think they're all completely taken up with domestic politics. And NATO is about Turkey, Sweden, and Finland. Tom, thanks for getting us back on track. Yeah. That's really important. <laughs> What's going on? Effortless. Oil. You know Oil went up 50 cents while we this. were looking at you, John. We're at 1.9%. <laughs> 11161. It's going to be back, Tom. We're going to do this all week. Can't <laughs> wait. Can't wait. Lear is 1830. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Live from New York City, this is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Good morning to you all. Futures positive about a half of 1% on the S&P on the Nasdaq 100, up four tenths of 1%. For all the talk on a consensus of overwhelming bearishness, I have to say that Wall Street's still pretty divided. The average price target year-end about 4,600. You take a listen to Lisa Shannon and Morgan Stanley. She says the earnings cuts, the downgrades haven't even gotten started. She's complaining about that. And then the likes of City say earnings will be better than feared. I know that it sounds very gloomy, but when you listen to the south side, I think it's pretty mixed Bramo at this point still. I haven't seen the downgrades in a massive, massive way just yet, and we're still waiting for a bit of a mere culpa over at J.P. Morgan and Marco Kalanovic that we have not seen. <laughs> well, let's be clear. Some of us have given up on a mea culpa, and I don't expect to hear one out of him in the near term. There is a question, though, about why S&P net, uh, net margin expectations are at the highest ever at a time when you have economists and macro strategists downgrading their expectations rapidly. Interesting, isn't it? Deer in the headlights. That's what Lisa Shannon said, seemingly waiting for companies to tell them what to do with their earnings outlook. Your equity market's positive. Can we hold on to the gains we didn't yesterday? So far, so good. In the bond market, Lisa went through the supply, the supply that you get from the Treasury side of things, seven year, a little bit later. Look out for that. Yeah, that was, on the that. data that front, things get interesting on Friday. We get an ISM in the United States of America, and you'll hear from Chairman Powell 
tomorrow. We've heard from President Lagarde already. Let's take a look at euro dollar just briefly. CPI in the eurozone at the end of the week. Uni credit think that we go to 8.6% from 8.1 on eurozone CPI. 105.88 on euro dollar. Why does all this matter? This word gradualism over at the ECB for a lot of people implies 25 basis point hikes. Orderly, predictable kind <coughs> of stuff. The optionality word gets interesting. Because, Tom, when you start to see inflation break out, do the Hawks get a little bit more leverage on that governing council to push this ECB to break away from moving well, in an orderly, gradual 25 basis point clip and start to deliver something maybe a little bit bigger? Their, their data, we'll talk to Jean Bovin about this, but their data dependency, John, flat out is parsing between headline inflation and the gloom of 8 and 9 percent and what we're going to see in core inflation. We'll get to that in Kona Hick in a minute. but. But, John, I, I think this, this, this reality that the public is focused on top-line inflation and the Bloomberg world is focused on core inflation, can't, can't say enough about that. Just a number to throw out, Tom, only credit looking for 4%. <clears throat> core exactly. in the Eurozone later this week. Yeah. I mean, there it is 4%, and that's not 6% in America. Uh, but nevertheless, the trend there is a mystery, and we'll get much more on that. We'll talk to Jean Bovin and BlackRock about that here in a bit. Right now, on some of the dynamics of our inflation, Kona Hick joins us, head of research at EDNF Man. And what's great about Kona, it's not only oil, oil, oil. It's about everything as well. Kona, let me just start with a food observation. Can you take American food prices and extrapolate them over to the rest of the world. If food prices in America have broken and rolled over, can you say that about Asia, Europe, or for that matter, Tunisia? To a certain extent, yes, you can, because... USA is one of the world's largest exporters of grains and oil seeds. So yes, and you have the futures prices, which are um, in the Chicago border chain. Those, those are set there. So <clears> very much dependent on what the US crops are like. So yes, I would argue that the US is hugely influential on world grains and oil seeds um, supply and demand prices. Can you talk to the monetary thugs and tell them that if you see food inflation roll over and maybe even commodities ebb off a little bit, X oil that that will allow core inflation to come in nation to nation. Yes, I think to a certain extent the monetary authorities have actually ac accepted that. They've acknowledged that, you know, core inflation, food, energy, that's, that whole thing is no longer transitory. It's very sticky and they're worried. And I think this last two weeks where we started to see commodity inflation come off a little bit for various reasons. I think the recessionary fears on oil demand, um, also the fact that we're coming closer to harvest in, in the Western Hemisphere, um, that is allowing some of the crop prices to come off, oil prices to come off. And in turn, the market is sensing that maybe the commodity inflation or the core inflation is, going to, is reaching peak. And I think that's allowing the markets to recover a bit. So what we're when I say markets, I mean the stock markets. They're beginning to think that, oh, maybe we've we're getting close to peak inflation yeah. because commodities are there. Well, but Kona, you actually try to throw some cold water on this idea by talking about the physical market for oil in particular versus the futures market. This is what Javier Blas was talking about yesterday as well. There is a huge disconnect there with the physical market pricing in a tightness that you are not seeing in futures. Which market is right? So the futures is always anticipatory. So they're always going to try and be one step ahead of the physical market. They're going to see what's coming next. And the, yes, they're worried about the recession ahead and how that's going to ultimately destroy demand for fuel. But we're not there yet, not right now. We're still at this post-pandemic pent-up demand phase where demand for <coughs> driving, fuel, holidays, aviation, it's still really, really strong. No one's stopping at um, even $5 gas. You're not seeing that much of a drop in uh, driving. So what I think is, yes, demand still today is very strong. And supply, as we know, OPEC is just about able to meet their targets. Um, we're nowhere near us, uh, resolving the, the, um, the tightness right now. That is uh, later when we do get demand destruction. But that's what the futures market is reflecting, whereas the physical market, as you said, really, really tight right now. And Kona, this is really the issue, is how much pain needs to be uh, meted out now to get to where futures are down the line in terms of how high barrels have to go in terms of price and where the uh, price that the pump has to go to. I think so. I think you're absolutely right. So, you know, even at $120 per barrel, we 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 didn't necessarily see the amount of demand destruction that's required. So you need 
continued price pain, if you like. And in combination with that, we need to see more supply coming on stream. Well, but Kona, so I think, quickly, yeah. can you just put a number on that? Where do you start to see demand destruction? I think it's at the 120, 130 levels, you're beginning to really start getting that pain threshold. And then we got that before, before it started coming off again. So I think that's the target you're looking at. 125, 130 is really when you start seeing demand destruction to kicking in. Kona, talk to me about the distance from Tunisia to Egypt right now and the dominant commodity of wheat. It's a sideshow to so many of our viewers and listeners, but it seems to be a reality and a resonance to the Arab Spring. How critical right now are food prices along the southern Mediterranean? Absolutely critical. Um, that's the one area that are most vulnerable right now to world food prices. They're hugely dependent on wheat imports. And traditionally, they've always had those supplies coming from Ukraine and Russia, who are the world's, one of the world's largest exporters of grains. Obviously, Ukraine is out of the picture. Russia is trying to meet some of those needs. Um, there's a lot of sanctions that it has to get through. And obviously, the ports are still very unstable. Um, and they're having to face a much higher import bill. And you're absolutely right. They do not want to face another Arab Spring. That is the stuff that causes food riots. And so they, you know, they, there, is, there is unrest at, at, at household levels. So they've got to be very careful. Now, the good news is that European harvest, Australian harvest, which should, in theory, be good. So you might right. start seeing some relief around the corner, but we're not quite there yet. What can institutions, and particularly men in Bavaria not wearing ties, do about it? What, what do the developed world institutions do about wheat prices on the southern Mediterranean? I mean, at the moment, a lot of the governments are providing food subsidies. That's what they do. There's, you know, there's rations, there's cards that yeah. you provide the poorest households. But the, ultimately, what they want to do is they want to rebuild those reserves at every... So you're seeing food protectionism, you're seeing food import hoarding. That's something very typical in food import depending emerging markets. That's something which we're going to see. And what unfortunately, the the reaction for that is that you end up seeing a less um, tradable export available. So that becomes a bit of a problem. But like I mentioned, I think we are looking at harvest around the corner. Hopefully that should provide some short-term relief. But there is a longer-term problem, which we're not talking about, the fact that fertilizers are also very expensive. So we need that food mm -hmm. supply response to be more sustainable. For that, we need fertilizers, and that is an issue right now. Kona, this and is Russia really sobering control. stuff. Really, really sobering stuff. And we always appreciate catching up with you. Kona Hack there of EDF and MAN. Uh, Tom, on a less serious note, the ties are the G7. I got scolded for that yesterday. I was told it's hot. Oh, Climate change on. is a serious issue. No, I, and we shouldn't joke I, I about the agree. fact that the leaders had to no, take the ties. Clearly, I don't agree at the time. You were being completely responsible. And, you know, it, it's just a whole sartorial thing. What's interesting, totally John, if President totally. Trump, <laughs> John, <laughs> you? if, if you, President Anytime. Trump had been there, do you think he would have gone tieless? I don't think so. I don't think he would have taken the tie off. Uh, uh, but what, this, is, this, is, this is an important conversation, Lee, so let it carry on. Don't interrupt. Okay, please carry on. This Go. is why we booked Stravitas. You guys can hang yourselves. Really, really important. <laughs> we booked Stravitas for this. Tom, you said something that I don't think um, many people heard. Did you call them monetary thugs? <laughs> yeah, they're monetary thugs. They're is just that, guessing. What, what is a, a monetary thug? A monetary yes, thug yep, is yep, someone yep. Who's, 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 you know, Philip Pildenbrand, Philip Pildenbrand was on in London here two hours ago talking about Blanchard and Gali from 2005 and divine coincidence. I'm going to talk to Bovin about that. There's so much hot air right now, John, given the uncertainty. On the back end of the equation, the epsilon is truly off the chart. And I've heard more hot air in the last 90 days on monetary theory, gamesmanship, whatever. I'm just worn out by it. OK, right. you yeah. tell me, I'm who's sorry. the biggest monetary thug? The individual hiking interest rates now or the one doing a ton of QE going into the end of the year and the start of this year and no, inflation still the climbing? Thugs. The thugs are all the punditry and the, you know, the gaming this and gaming that. The only one I'm going to give a victory lap to is Bullard, who was out front with Summers, saying, you know, inflation's up. And Bullard at least has an optimistic tack on a good American economy. Tell me you can throw Blanchard in there, throw Valerian in there as well. It was groupthink at the Fed. Yeah, I, yeah. well, I'm going to cut him some slack, John. You've I think we underestimate that, the fiscal impulse. They had a natural disaster. TK. They did a ridiculous fiscal impulse, and this is what was wrought. 
how much QE did they do in the first three months of the year? That was an overlay by the new administration. Come on. Yeah. Futures up a half of one percent. Secretary Yellen's That's going to Indonesia, case. John. I Look think the whole markets. all of us should go to Jakarta, do the show from Jakarta with Secretary. I think we should Yellen. go down to the Fed and knock the door of those monetary thugs, thugs. Tom, and see if they want to talk to us. Bring them back. Bloomberg's. That's fine. <laughs> From New York, this Are is Bloomberg. Are they really going to change the ECB meeting? Let's talk about ties. <laughs>Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rosika Gupta. A Russian missile attack on a shopping mall in central Ukraine has killed at least 18. Authorities say dozens more were wounded and more than 30 are still missing. A group of seven leaders meeting in Germany called the attack a war crime. In California, the state Senate has passed legislation that would allow the public to sue firearm manufacturers for harm caused by guns. The bill is designed to use industry standards to permit lawsuits despite federal law, which immunizes gun makers and dealers from civil liability. It's part of a package targeting gun violence that California Governor Gavin Newsom has promised to sign. And NATO is set to label China a systemic challenge when it outlines its new policy guidelines this week. Bloomberg's also learned that the U.S.-led alliance will highlight Beijing's deepening partnership with Russia. Still, NATO won't go as far as to call China an adversary. And the founder of one of China's biggest private equity investors said the nation's tech firms are turning a corner after that recent market rout. Fred Hu of Primavera Capital told Bloomberg there's a lot of value to be discovered. I definitely think there's value. Uh, there's some really proven, not just the leaders in China, but maybe globally. Uh, their uh, violation has been hammered um, you know, out of the panic. And who is a former Goldman Sachs rainmaker. He has maintained a broadly positive outlook for tech firms, even as others have abandoned the sector. Global News 24 hours a day on Aaron on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. We will transform the NATO response force and increase the number of our high readiness forces to well over 300,000. Together, this constitutes the biggest overhaul of our collective defense and deterrence since the Cold War. Important couple of days coming up in Madrid, Spain. That's Jens Stoltenberg, the NATO Secretary General, NATO leaders convening in the Spanish capital over the next couple of days. From New York City this morning, good morning with Tom Keane, Lisa Bramitz, I'm Jonathan Ferro. Equity futures up a half of 1% on the S&P, on the Nasdaq 100, up a half of 1%. Also, China easing quarantine rules for incoming inbound travelers that may be helping out things a little bit in the commodity market too wci 111.34 this story from the south china morning post tom president xi will head to hong kong on june 30th before the 25-year celebrations on july 1st according to the paper she won't be staying overnight in hong kong but tk this will be the first trip out of the mainland yeah, it's Since the pandemic, and, it's and, been a while. Yeah, get out the calendar. It's June on to July, and he has a hugely important meeting here, I believe, in November. It's in the autumn uh, months where he has to really reaffirm his leadership of all of China, including Hong Kong. So really, every step, John, is studied and analyzed. Well, that's the number I didn't know that. either, Tom. First visit to the city in five years. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. The VIX, 26.97, a 26 handle on the VIX, I think, is really uh, extraordinary. Now, an important conversation in a brief for all of Bloomberg surveillance by James Trevitas to say he is vice chairman of global affairs at Carlisle Group barely touches upon his public service to the United States Navy and America. The effort to risk it all is out. Each chapter important on admirals that had courage. Admiral Stavitas, thank you so much for joining us this morning. The Turkey-Sweden relationship is extraordinary. It goes back to 1730. The Great Northern War was not the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Montreal Canadiens. It was Sweden and Turkey against Russia. And once again, they're trying to recalibrate that relation. What will be the price to get Mr. Erdogan to allow Sweden and neighboring Finland to be part of NATO? Well, first and foremost, um, this is a win for NATO, a huge one to bring those two high-tech militaries, very capable. They deployed troops under my command to Afghanistan. I know these militaries well. They'll be very welcome and very capable in NATO. In terms of the price, what we're seeing is President Erdogan 
uh, negotiating, if you will. He wants to squeeze two principal concessions out. He wants more attention paid to the uh, Kurdish issues. He feels there's uh, some level of Kurdish activity in Sweden in particular. He wants a cap placed on that. And then secondly, at a larger scale, Tom, he wants uh, more high-tech military capability in the hands of the Turks. Um, export controls lifted on some right. of the systems. Gets very technical very quickly. But I think, bottom line, these are both points that can be negotiated. I think we will see right. Sweden and Finland in the alliance by the fall. The Bosphorus is 19 miles. Maybe it's two or three miles wide at the absolute maximum. When you see it, folks, it's shockingly uh, narrow. How does a submarine go up that canal? <laughs> uh, very carefully and uh, uh, on the surface would be the two answers. And um, uh, at the end of the day, Turkey's control over that very narrow strait is an important part of the functionality of NATO in the Black Sea. And Tom, as you know, and we were just talking about, getting grain out of Odessa in Ukraine is going to be critical to global food security. We're going to have to open that either uh, with negotiations with Russia, which is blockading it, or put some level of uh, escort system in place, much like we did with oil tankers in the 1980s. So the Bosphorus will be uh, more of a conversation, I think, in the weeks and months to come. And Admiral Stavridis, this is all about NATO's position versus Russia, once thought as not necessarily an adversary, but that's obviously changing. I know my co-hosts think of me as a broken record when it comes to this NATO meeting because I'm completely focused on what they talk about with China, this idea of potentially labeling China a systemic challenge. How big of a shift is this? How much muscle is there behind? Huge shift in the sense that if you go back to the previous strategic concept, came out in 2010 when I was Supreme Allied Commander, and China didn't appear, cyber barely appeared. Russia was postured at that point as a potential uh, nation that NATO could work with. That's all changed, and uh, Russia will be the top headline threat um, China is being categorized as, as you said, a systemic challenge, um, but significantly going to be four observer nations from the Pacific at that Madrid summit. That would be Japan, South Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, that is very significant to see them coming to Madrid. It speaks to NATO's concerns about China. Well, uh, you know, when you talk about Russia being the number one threat, they're perceived as the aggressor. So it's a little bit less risky to do so, considering that the conflict is already very much uh, in full force. How much are we looking at an aggressive position versus China poking the bear in a way that's going to prompt some sort of response versus just getting together the allies with some sort of plan? How big is the distinction? Um, the distinction is enormous at this point, and I'd categorize it, Lisa, as with Russia, it's in many ways, it's tactical. It's very focused on the Ukraine situation. We're going to get to an outcome there. Um, and I think NATO is, is standing together very strongly. That's why the updraft you just heard from the secretary general from 40,000 in the ready force to 300,000. That's about Russia. We're not going to have land forces engaged with China at any point. With China, it's a strategic set of challenges, including territoriality in the South China Sea, I think will be a significant one for NATO. Um, but at the end of the day, the philosophy with China is going to be confront China where you must. South China Sea, human rights, but cooperate where you can. So it's a very different feel between the two uh, the two nations of Russia and China. Always wonderful to hear from you, sir, as always. That was James DeFridis there of the Carlisle Group on China. And Lisa, I don't think you're a broken record at all. Aww. I think this is so, so important. Chancellor Schultz speaking right now, expecting China not to undermine Russian sanctions. And this idea that NATO will label China and the Chinese Communist Party a systemic challenge, once again exposing the weakness of German foreign and economic policy of the last several decades. This is Europe's biggest trading partner. And if they're about to call China a systemic challenge, then it's a critical economic vulnerability for Germany that is yet to be addressed, Lisa, in a material way. 
And when you talk about what Olaf Scholz just said, that he expects China not to undermine Russia's sanctions, what does that mean? Where are the red lines when China is importing a record amount of oil, at least on a dollar basis, <clears throat> from Russia? When you look at how much uh, there is some sort of economic partnership between those nations, at what point does it trigger a more aggressive approach? It is a huge issue, especially given the economic dependence the of the likes of Germany. two biggest geopolitical challenges of, of this world right now for the West, Tom. China and Russia. Well, they're there. Germany's I, the weak link. I, John, I want to both. note, in the last 15 minutes, market's really beginning to move. Dollar stronger for the first time in three days. Yields up by five basis points. 325.28. Equities positive by about a half of 1%. From New York City on TV and radio, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. I don't think we're turning a corner until the market knows that we have definitively avoided a recession. The Fed has a really still a clear and present danger on inflation and they've been behind the curve. I think we might still see some upside surprises in inflation. We're really trying to digest what the Federal Reserve is telling us. The least resistance from here is still tighter financial conditions. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bravitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Equity futures up six tenths of 1%. TK, as G7 leaders confront very similar problems. They're going to confront the markets as well. Just in the last 20 minutes, John, we've really started to see the markets. All sorts of little tweaks, little nudges, if you will, across the Bloomberg terminal, indicating a return to what we saw, John, two or three weeks ago. Those G7 leaders are going to return home to the same challenges, higher oil prices, stronger dollars. Central bankers are confronting them, TK. We heard from President Lagarde a little bit earlier this morning. <clears throat> yeah. We'll hear from Chairman Powell. Outline that. And Governor Outline Bailey that. Tomorrow. You looked at that. I didn't look at that. The speech is interesting, Tom. Yeah. Letting get what they've got to do and opening the door perhaps to a bigger move further down the road. And I think you're going to hear a lot more of that, of that in the future, Lee. So they're set to go 25 basis points in July. The door's open to move away from that gradual policy stance and maybe go a little bit bigger further down the road. Front loading is the word we're going to hear again and again. And we heard this again from Mary Daly, St. Louis, uh, Saint, excuse me, San Francisco Fed president, talking about how a 75 basis point rate hike is on the table next month for the Federal Reserve. They got it so wrong. And this, I think, is spooking everyone, that they misunderstood how sticky inflation would be. They don't want to let it get entrenched. They don't want to make another policy error. Headline inflation for the Eurozone. Unicredit, I keep going to that report, looking for 8.6%. That's bang in line with America. The core picture, very different. Tom, a little bit earlier this morning, you referred to some people <coughs> as monetary thugs. Do you want to give us a little bit more color on that and what yeah, you meant by that? It's a punditry that's out there. I don't mean the leaders. I don't mean the central bank leaders. I mean the punditry. We're going to talk to people like Philip Hildenbrand, who we talked to two, three hours ago on Bloomberg, and Jean Bovin, absolutely first rate here in the coming moments. And, and John, that's the kind of people I want to listen to right now, not the parlor game about what the Fed's going to do three meetings out. We don't know what they're going to do. Are you calling Lisa and I monetary thugs? Yes, Lisa's. That's a, what I thought. Look, yeah, look, you John, that's what I thought. Directly look, at me. What is needed here? Here, John, up. is it not a Mia culpa? What's needed is a Bramo culpa. <laughs> okay. A Bramo, what a is Bramo a Bramo culpa? culpa? About a, what? A Bramo culpa is where you're just like you're worried about what you said and you've got to reaffirm your negativity and your worry and gloom. And, you know, the Bramo gloom that's out I'm there. Gloomy. That's a natural. I'm neurotic. It's, it's I mean, yes, neurotic. I yeah. don't have to do that. It's a Bramo culpa. Got, there's no Mia culpa for Lisa this year, Tom. Best six months for her forecast of the last 10 years. Yeah, the last that's the 10 true. years before that, a nightmare. But, you know, that's what he was implying, which is right. Monetary thugs. Thank hey, you, Tom. Thanks. Bitterly, it. John, good. bitterly of Citigroup she yesterday was, was absolutely brilliant, folks. Here's the research from Citigroup. Listen, in the last 10 years, up 16% per year, and you're up only 9.7% if you take out the 10 best days in the last 10 years. Kristen was wonderful. Wow. And if anyone's wondering why we're still in separate studios, I think maybe you can work that out <laughs> for yourself. I'm a thug. And apparently I'm a thug too. And okay. I'm Futures just up a half of 100%. 100%. I think you need a vacation, Tom, <laughs> to be honest I need with you. A vacation. And that's that 100 up four tenths of I'm 1%. Going south, 52nd also, Street. You're equity mark with a lift this morning. A good morning to you. Yields with a lift as well, up another five basis points. All of a sudden, <clears> looking at 325 again. 
324.90 on a US 10 year. Crude positive two at 1.5%, 111.25 as we start to ease the quarantine restrictions in China. Lisa, about two years behind the rest of the world, seemingly. Yeah, and whether this is actually some sort of relief from the zero COVID policy uh, really remains to be seen. Jenny Ellen coming out and saying oil, really the main driver of inflation. Well, it's not entirely the main driver. It's also housing prices. At 9 a.m., we get the S&P CoreLogic Case-Shiller 20-City Home Price Index. We have seen it rising at a record pace. Unbelievable to see a 20% increase in the, uh, in the uh, price of a home. How much do we see that cooling off? And then how much does that feed into consumer confidence? At 10 a.m., we get the Conference Board's June Consumer Confidence Reading. How much does this diverge from the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Survey, which has shown a record deterioration in how people are feeling? We haven't seen the same kind of negativity in the consumer confidence numbers, partly because it doesn't reflect as much some of the oil and gas costs that people are experiencing. How much does that divergence continue versus perhaps a little bit more convergence? And 1 p.m., I really am curious about this, John. The U.S. is planning to sell $40 billion of seven-year notes. We talked about the auction yesterday, the five-year <clears throat> note auction. Did not go well. How much do investors boycott this particular auction of seven-year notes that are less liquid than 10-year notes? They have been trading uh, with yields that are higher than 10-year notes for months now because of that lack of liquidity, because of that uncertainty over the longer-term horizon. John, which investors come to the table and see this as a good deal at a time of such uncertainty? Elisa, you've done a tremendous job of explaining this over the last year or so. It's not just the seven-year, is it? It's the 20-year as well. The highest yield on the curve is not the 30-year, it's the 20-year at 362. This What's has, going on with that maturity? This has to do with liquidity, right? This is a relatively new reintroduction of a tenure, and you don't have as big of a market and people trading within it. And it really highlights, John, the lack of liquidity that we keep hearing from investors that underpin some of the uncertainties, particularly with the direction of yields. Lisa, thank you. Really important points. Let's get to Jean Bavan, the head of the BlackRock Investment Institute. They just had their Outlook Forum very, very recently. Jean, let's start with that. Your conclusion, sir, as you sit around the table with the team over at BlackRock. Well, good, uh, good to be with you this morning. Thanks. Um, yeah, the, that was pretty two days of pretty intense discussion. I think the key takeaway um, thing that came out clearly is um, uh, we've been building up to that, but we are uh, in a new regime. And I think the way we think about it now is you know, uh, and Tom, I think, will appreciate that. Uh, you go back to the mid 2000s, there was this debate about the great moderation, this uh, remarkable feat where we had managed to decline the, the volatility of both inflation and output. Uh, we were debating why. Uh, you know, policymakers were taking credit for this, good policy being the reason. Uh, the alternative proposal, like Stuck and Watson at the time, were proposing that maybe it was just good luck. Uh, we'd been lucky. And I think now with 20 more years of uh, experience in the last two years, I think good luck is a big part of the story. I think we are in a world now that is very different from the last 40 years, uh, one, one that is going to be driven by supply a lot more, and that creates much sharper trade-offs. Uh, and we're going to see a pickup in macro volatility. We have seen that. I think this is, this is real and persistent. Uh, and that leads to a much more complex world, which is not reflected in the narrative you're seeing out there. So I think that's the main key takeaway. Um, that we took away. And then from there, I mean, a lot of investment implications. Well, let's talk about some of those investment implications, in particular, whether you also see peak yields given some of these supply constraints that could drive prices higher on a more persistent level. Yeah, so I think we're going we're, we're gonna to see, um, I think we're set up for market to receive any incoming information on uh, that is more inflationary very hawkishly. So that's going to be the bias. And then once we're going to see data that comes in and maybe gives some relief on inflation, I think we're going to look through this. So I think this bias is going to be with us for the next few months. I think that's going to be a bias that the central bank themselves will display. And so as a result, I think um, uh, we're not at peak yield, peak yield there. I think we're going to see uh, you know front end of the curve continuing to, uh, to be under pressure to go up. Um, and recession risks continue to build up. Um, so I think that's the story for the next few months until we see a bigger pivot for central banks, which we think will come but it's going to be after some pain has been done. So, Jean, with that backdrop, it sounds like you're probably in the camp of profit margin compression. It's not exactly a Goldilocks scenario for stocks either. So where's the haven if both bonds and stocks are potentially under, under pressure in this new volatility? Yeah, just to pick up on one key point there, I, we don't see a Goldilocks uh, on the table. I mean, that's what we mean by the great moderation is over. Uh, that period uh, where we could hope to see you know, both stability and inflation output eventually come to fruition. 
that was good bull bullish for both bonds and, and, and equities that that's kind of over no goldilocks um so we need to be a lot more careful tactically we're we're positioned very cautiously um you know neutral on equities we don't see the rally here as being something that you want to participate into uh, at this juncture and and bonds will be um government bonds will continue to be under under pressure uh over the time to come um given what we just said so um so a more cautious stance tactically. I think on the more longer term horizon, um, we, we're going to see a part of, you know, we don't see the, if there's a recession, it's not going to be a massive recession. I think we'll, we'll get to the point where we're going to be looking through this. And then equities from a longer, longer term perspective, I think, are a place to be if you can look beyond the one, one year uh, and beyond. Um, but uh, until we get there, uh, it's going to be, uh, it's going to feel, uh, feel more painful in portfolios. Hard to look beyond the next month. Or next week at the moment, Sean. Thank you, sir. As always, Sean Parfan <laughs> of the BlackRock Investment Institute. TK always depends on your time horizon, but at the moment, right. it's so <clears throat> difficult to just get out beyond the summer. Let me explain this, John. It's really, really important. There was a fervent bout of literature in 2004 led by Olivier Blanchard and the great Jordi Galli, who wrote with Richard Clarida, and also some important work by Greg Mankiw, which pushed against the freshwater Marvin Goodfriend school and said there is a sacrifice to inflation stability. And the key question here for people like Bovin, who's absolutely first rate, easily could run the Bank of Canada someday. There's no question about that. John, the absolute critical distinction is when we get done with bringing inflation down to the easy level, say 5% or 4%, then what? And these guys are out front thinking about what happens when we get to just arbitrarily 5% inflation. That will be a huge deal, John, at Jackson Hole. And Tom, you're picking up on a really, really important point, but they don't want to talk about it, do they? Tolerating anything above the, two. No, the bankers, yeah, the central bankers do not. No, no, they can't. And to be fair, in the game, they really, Jay Powell can't come out and say, uh, look, politicians, calm down. We're going to go from 8%, 9% down to 5%, and then we take a victory lap. They can't do that. What but, will they tolerate? Uh, Adam Posen, I'm going to go there somewhat with uh, Professor Blanchard talking about 3% as a new 2%. That's, that's uh, what I just said there, James Bullard would age. Jackson Hole is going to be an interesting one. The end of August, we will be there. Tom Keane. I Lisa love the Ramitz, two-tone Tony Lamas you picked out, John. I think they look great. The future's up a half of 1%. Are you styling us? Is that no. what you're doing? You're the new stylist. No, he already I, bought me L.L. Bean. What's he bought you? L.L. Bean. What is that? <laughs> oh, geez, John. Describe to you oh, in the my God. Lisa. Oh, oh, my God. God. What is that? Tom, what's going on? It's just right. it's <laughs> Okay. Futures are up. Good morning <laughs> to you. Put something in the tank. This is Bloomberg. I need something in the tank. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. China has made its biggest shift yet in its tough COVID zero policy. Quarantine times for inbound travelers has been reduced by half from 14 days to seven. That comes after Beijing and Shanghai said they had no new locally transmitted COVID infections for the first time since February. Runaway food inflation may be tamed soon, at least temporarily. Farm commodities have been falling after a surge that pushed up the price of everything from bread to chicken wings. The Bloomberg Agriculture Spot Sub-Index is on track for its biggest monthly drop since 2011. Fears of grain shortages is giving way to optimism that key producers will reap huge harvests. In San Antonio, Texas, 46 people were found dead in a semi-trailer, apparently the victims of heat strokes. Another 16 were taken to hospitals. Authorities suspect they were migrants. Texas has been seen a surge in immigration over its border with Mexico in recent years. Smugglers sometimes use commercial trucks to bring over migrants. And last year, companies defied the coronavirus pandemic to go public at a record pace. Now market volatility, inflation and fears of a downturn have brought an abrupt end to the listing party. According to data compiled by Bloomberg, companies have raised a combined $4.9 billion via U.S. initial public offerings this year. That's less than 6% of the record sum raised in the first half of 2021. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg.
This June, in honor of Pride Month and Juneteenth, Bloomberg brings you a special equality series every Thursday in June at 1 p.m. Eastern. Bloomberg Equality, celebrating inclusion this Pride Month and all year long. We expect to raise the key interest rates again in September, and I quote, if the medium-term inflation outlook persists or deteriorates, a larger increment will be appropriate at the September meeting. If the inflation outlook does not improve, we will have sufficient information to move faster. That was Christine Lagarde, the ECB president. That was a really important point in that speech a little bit earlier this morning from the ECB chief. You'll hear from her again tomorrow with Governor Bailey and Chairman Powell, Francine Lacroix, our very own. It's going to guide you through the coverage in Sintra, Portugal, kind of like the ECB's version of Jackson Hole, Tom, over the last few years. Yeah, I find... Trying to ramp that up. But not paper-driven. I sort of like it, to be honest, John. I think Sintra's a lot more about the debate of the moment with some real heavyweights, where Jackson Hole is really nerdy. I mean, is there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a difference there, John. Hearing from say. Emmanuel Macron right now, Tom. Oh. I think our audience will want to hear... Some of these headlines. Allies send weapons to Ukraine so they can defend, not attack. He does not favor listing Russia as a state sponsor of terror. Just a couple of the headlines there. On Crude, he said this, and I think this is fairly obvious. The situation with oil prices is unsustainable. In the words of Emmanuel Macron just moments ago, he's speaking to him right now. <clears throat> Maybe this is before Ulysses S. Grant showed up for the American Civil War a few years ago, but it is a confusing set of messages. Amory Hordern is in Germany on the G7 watch. And joining us now, Maria Tadeo in her Madrid uh, at a NATO meeting to come up. i got to rip up the script. Maria, I'll be as direct as I can. Macron, allies send weapons so Ukraine can defend, not attack. We have seen in the last 12 hours a horrific missile attack between Kiev and Crimea of a shopping mall. When do we lose this sophomoric idea that we are defending in Ukraine? Yes, and Tom, that is the entire issue for the Ukrainians. They always say this distinction between uh, attack and counteroffensive and the distinction on the weapons is, quote, stupid. At this point, Ukraine is defending all of its territory the best way it can, but it needs more. For allies, however, they still continue to fear that Russia could signal this or could interpret this as escalation. They worry about that. But I would also say, uh, to add up on the words of Emmanuel Macron, he did say what happened yesterday at that chopping center is once again quote the Russia is now using terror he doesn't want to call it a terrorist state but he did say this is terror and once again it's a war crime it's a crime de guerre he used uh, that phrase so there is there there isn't ambiguity when it comes to that it's just the issue about does it get to a point where you arm Ukraine so much the Russia will say you guys are now co-belligerent so anything that's NATO it's fair game well we're how close are we to that Maria I mean yeah. I'm absolutely baffled by it's a war, it's not a war, attack, defend, all the rest of it. I think Americans' heads are spinning on this. How close are we to actually saying it's a war? Well, I mean, Tom, there's no question that it is a war between Russia and Ukraine. The question is, everyone else going to jump in it? And we've seen repeatedly that the United States says they won't fight boots on the ground in Ukraine. That was the signal that Vladimir Putin wanted to get also from the Americans. Are you ready to fight for Ukrainians? The answer is pretty obvious. They'll supply the weapons, but they're not going to fight for Ukrainians. For the Europeans, is the same. And I mean, Macron also says there's a little bit of hypocrisy, irony in this, because every European country has agreed that they do not want to be co-belligerent in this. When you speak to some of the Eastern Europeans, however, countries like Poland, the Baltics, they already tell you or they'll tell you it only takes a second for this to escalate. But countries like Germany and the French are very scared of it. They don't want to be co-belligerents here. They want to help Ukraine but not fight the war themselves. Amory, one thing they're exploring now is a cap on the price of Russian crude. Now, this is pretty interesting because tomorrow, in the next couple of days, we'll hear from NATO leaders who are set to criticize China and at the same time, it's very difficult to see how a cap mm -hmm. on Russian crude prices will work without the participation of China. So AMH, walk me through it. How is this going to work? 
Well, again, this is just an idea, and they've agreed to continue discussions of idea. There's no set price on what the cap would be. There's no set timeline on when they would implement it and how the mechanism in actuality would work. And, Jonathan, you bring up a really good point, and there's two. One, China and India, which is bringing in a lot of Russian crude at the moment for, cheap disc for a very cheap discount, would have to sign on to this. The second part, of course, is that Russia would have to sign on to it. They'd be, have to say that they'd be willing to take that cut, and which the West wants to be very much closer to how much the, it costs for them to produce it. Uh, a lot of moving parts in here, yeah. and it means that the West would have to get China on board for this. We do know from Jake Sullivan, he had said on Monday to reporters that in the next <clears throat> few weeks, potentially we'll have this uh, phone call, a conversation between President Biden and Xi Jinping. But if I could just say one other point about NATO, how they're going to be able to gonna call out China. Can you believe where we are now? In 2010, when they came out with this document that guides them for the next decade, and now this document will guide them for another 10 years, China wasn't even mentioned, and Russia was called a partner. Right. It's a complete 180 at NATO in Madrid. So, Anne-Marie, building on this idea of how do you enforce some of these caps or measures with Russia and China, Olaf Scholz coming out this morning and saying that he ex expects China not to undermine Russian sanctions. How difficult is it to even determine what that means, given some of the vagaries here and the lack of cohesion on even just buying Russian oil? I mean, it's going to be very difficult because, again, China has this unity forever with Russia. Remember, they have this uh, new strategic statement that came out at the start of the year. And, of course, we have Chinese officials who really have not condemned the war at all. Uh, they are leaning more into that support of <laughs> President Putin. But we should also note a cap for China and India would be very helpful. That would be very much so cheap oil from Russia. But at the same time, if it is going to undermine President Putin, that can affect other parts of Beijing and New Delhi's relationship with Russia, it's going to be very hard to get that on board. Never mind the fact that they need to get insurance companies, shipping companies, and the finances on board for this. This kind of mechanism, which I know the United States is very much so for, when you look at Russian uh, natural gas going into Europe, uh, Premier Mario Draghi is very much so for. But how in actuality does a me mechanism like this get translated to the market? Incredibly difficult. And also, speaking of French President Emmanuel Macron, he doesn't want to stop at Russian crude. He's calling for caps on oil worldwide. Try to get the Gulf on board with that. Are you heading to Madrid after this? I'm going to stay for one more hit with you, Jonathan. I'm okay. going to do it on the road on the way. But, yeah, I'm going to be joining Maria. We have some tapas planned. I'm sure Maybe you do. That's Madrid what I was talk. trying to get into. I was just wondering what was going on here with Maria today and AMH and in Madrid together, Tom. Trouble. Trouble. I, you know, I think there's going to be trouble. <laughs> I'm looking to go south this week, and I'm we trying have a to get down Friday to 52nd night Second Street. I know you do. I'm yeah. just trying to... Yeah. Tease some of that out onto the show. No, you're trying to wind up Tom and tell us no, no, why no, can't he go on a I road think, trip? I think there's going to be a particular nightclub on Friday in Madrid that's hosting Maria and Anne Marie. Oh, yeah? That I'm just trying to get them to reveal slowly through the next couple of days. <laughs> okay. From New York, this is Bloomberg. <laughs> from New York City this morning. Good morning to you all on TV and radio. Here's your rally, if you can call it that, up six-tenths of one percent oh, on, on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're up by seven-tenths of one percent. We've had a cut from Citigroup in the last 12 hours. They've gone from 4,700 down to 42. They think the second half, though, there could be a rally in store. They think the risk-reward is better. They think earnings will be better than feared. They're not alone. JP Morgan, Marko Kolanovic expect maybe in some parts of this market to recover all the losses in the second half from the first half because expectations are just so bad. Then you fold in the view of Lisa Shannon and Morgan Stanley who says, where are those weak expectations? Because at the company level, the analysts haven't started downgrading earnings yet in a material way. So things pretty divided on Wall Street as they always are. But Tom, I think that's counter to this view that everything is very gloomy because there are still some yes, people out yes. there that are very constructive on this equity market into the second half. Well, I thank our team for booking optimists here, John. I think there's many more optimists out there than 
sort of the, the aura, particularly the weekend gloom, John. As you get to Thursday and Friday out on the Internet, there's a lot of world coming to an end out there, and there's a whole bunch of people pushing against that. And I'm going to go back to my core theme, John, which is corporations will adapt, as we saw from Federal Express six, seven days ago. It will come down to corporate earnings, Tom, and you're right. If there is a fear out there right now, there is the fear that that is the next shoe <laughs> to drop and we'll be on top of that story. I think July 14th is when things kick off with JP Morgan. So is it that soon? In I a couple of weeks that. time, Tom. Let's look at the bond market just quickly. June 14th, just short of 350 on a 10 year. We backed away. Now we're backing up again on a 10 year by four basis points to just short of 325. Let's call it 324. This gets more interesting tomorrow. We hear from Chairman Powell on Friday, ISM manufacturing. For the ECB, we've already heard from President Lagarde. You'll hear from her again tomorrow. For euro dollar, it's going to be about inflation at the end of this week. Inflation coming up on Friday, and it could come in in and around 8.5%. That's the median estimate in our survey so far. Only credit going for 8.6%. Right now, Tom, euro dollar 105. 81 off the weakest point of the year which had a 103 handle but still pinned down at these kind of levels yeah. and you still try and work out what's in store for the eurozone through the rest of this year yeah, i'd watch dollar yen as well john 136.71 is the daily high there we're nowhere near that but nevertheless to get a 137 print weaker yen would be a surprise for the week we're, again we're not there yet lisa things to say about auctions later they're happening. They're and happening. I'm looking for They're them. Happening. I honestly I want to see how much demand there is, especially overseas, especially because some of the peak inflation ideas are getting challenged by that number that we're gonna get on Friday in the Euro region and beyond. <clears throat> Tom, you excited for that? I'm as you might see. I, I mean I can tell. There's the auction. Aren't, do you, do you think it's valid, right? I John? think it's valid. I yeah. just think it's entertaining that you spend every single show trying to convince Tom that it's important <laughs> and he's still not on board. <laughs> That's some of your cross-asset price action. Let's get some single names. We can do that with Remain. Good morning, Remain. Hey, good morning, John. Well, here's something that's important. And, of course, all eyes on China right now. And all the major movers here in the pre-market, at least to the upside, seem to have a link now uh, to what we're hearing over there, the first major loosening of those COVID-related quarantine restrictions. So most of the big gainers that you're seeing in the pre-market in the U.S. are those travel stocks that would benefit most from that easing. A lot of the casino stocks, including Las Vegas Sands, uh, Wynn and Melco, the companies that have a big presence uh, in Macau, all rallying here on the day. Uh, Las Vegas Sands up about 7% here in the pre-market. U.S. airlines like United and American also higher, as are a lot of the cruise lines. And Trip.com up about 16%. Obviously, this is a comp travel company based in China, and its primary customers are outbound China travelers. They're seeing a nice boost from this as well. So keep an eye uh, on a lot of the travel stocks as well. But also keep an eye on Nike. It was interesting. They came out with earnings last night, and those shares are down by about 2% here in the pre-market. They said their China business is not doing well at all, down about 20% on a year-over-year -year basis. And they said that basically about 60% of their China business had been affected by the COVID shutdowns, and then it could take as much as three weeks to get everything back up and running to normal. That's when all of the restrictions are actually eased. <clears throat> Nike did also address the issue that there's been a sort of growing swell of nationalism that has actually shifted a lot of consumers away from Nike and to more uh, Chinese-made brands. So something to keep an eye on mm -hmm. there. You flip it up, we want to stay on the China theme. Second biggest volume mover this morning, actually, a company called Playtica. It's a gaming company. We're learning that Joffrey Capital is going to take a major stake in this company from its Chinese owner. So this is a big deal, kind of a shift in uh, uh, the majority ownership, I should say. Uh, the share is higher here in the pre-market by about 5%. Sec uh, the biggest volume mover out here in the U.S., though, is Robinhood. Robinhood shares down about 3.5% uh, in the pre-market. They rallied 14% yesterday on the back of that Bloomberg scoop that Sam Bankman Freed's FTX uh, crypto exchange was potentially looking into the idea of buying Robinhood. Sam Bankman Fried later came out with a statement that he emailed to Bloomberg saying that there is no active MA discussions, though he didn't necessarily address the substance of the Bloomberg article, which is whether he was actually interested in it at all. So these shares have been oscillating all around as a lot of people try to figure out what he's going to do. And of course, we got uh, the results of those uh, bank stress tests from the Fed last week. Last night, of course, we got the announcements about the dividend uh, buybacks mm -hmm. uh, and uh, shareholder returns. Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs boosting uh, their dividends and buybacks while J.P. Morgan and Citigroup standing pat, though all of those names are higher in the pre-market. Morgan Stanley, Tom, up 3%. Romain, thank you so much. To close this afternoon, right now, an incredibly important conversation. Gregory Peters joins us. He's co-chief investment officer at PGM Fixed Income, but someone with decades of perspective from Morgan Stanley to PGM of the ups and downs of the golden age of fixed income. Greg, thank you uh, for joining. As a blended idea, we're down 12% on price. On bonds, you write of a golden age and saying it's over. 
can we get a Hail Mary for the bond market like we did from 47, 48 out to the Eisenhower disinflation four and five years later, where it's big price up, yield down? So I still think we have a little ways to go on this one, honestly, as there's all this talk around uh, peak inflation and peak hawkishness. And I think those two terms are being conflated in here. Uh, as you can have this peak inflation uh, and then not go peak hawkishness. And what I mean by that is that there's all this sensitivity in the market where inflation is going to ultimately show signs of coming down. And that means the bull market begin for bonds, which means the Fed doesn't have to tighten as much. What I think is missing there is the persistent nature of inflation that might actually cause the Fed to actually hike even more than anticipated. Greg, let's dig into that a little bit. In other words, you think that people are underestimating how sticky this inflation is and how committed uh, the Fed really is to not getting the inflation rate down to 3%, as Adam Posen says, but down to 2% in short order. Yeah, so I'm not sure of where inflation will land ultimately. I think that's the challenge, that's the difficulty. But I'm pretty sure that the Fed is extremely focused on inflation. And I think that's what investors have missed this entire period which this is a Volcker-esque type of Fed where they are clearly focused on getting inflation down and they are not going to throw away 40 years of credibility, which we know actually matters a lot over the medium to long term. They're not going to throw that credibility away just because, uh, um, you know, the markets are telling them to. So, Greg, just to take that a step further, does that mean this Fed won't tolerate an easing of financial conditions? anytime soon. And what does that mean for how you put money to work? Well, so I think somewhat perversely, this, the financial condition picture has been much stronger than I think uh, the Fed uh, anticipated. So, uh, so um, I think financial conditions have to worsen. I think that's the natural uh, path here. Yes, you've had really big moves thus far. I understand that there's more value in the market today than there was, you know, six months ago. Absolutely. But for example, we just had this internal poll that we conducted with you know, over 300 of our investment professionals and 76 percent of those folks believe that uh, we'll have a hard landing. And in Europe, uh, it's almost 90 percent believe there's a hard landing. So the point being that there's still a lot of risk out there. Um, uh, on this hard landing camp. I just want to pick up on that line, Greg. Financial conditions have to worsen. Can you give me an idea of what that would look like and where to look for it? Well, so I think it's the national uh, items of stocks. I, uh, I do believe risk assets have to cheapen up more. I know the focus is on earnings. That should be the focus. Uh, but we're coming off this margin type of environment. All this operating leverage embedded in these capital structures uh, that cuts both ways. So if you actually see a, a slowdown in revenues, uh, that's going to have, you know, the opposite benefit that we saw coming out of the uh, pandemic. So I worry about risk assets, uh, both equities uh, and credit in here. I think there's more room to go. With such a high probability, I think at least, a high probability of a hard landing, I'm not convinced we're priced for that. Um, in a scenario-based way. So how much cash are you carrying at the moment, Greg? Just give me a picture of what you've been doing, what your picture looks like going into the end of this year. Yeah, so for us, it's not so much about cash. We have increased our cash levels on the margin. Uh, it's more around the liquidity in the market, which is something that should be focused on as well. So you're seeing liquidity and fixed income, which is always fraught, uh, uh, but you know, much more kind of volatile, uh, uh, liquidity picture. So we're getting more defensive. We have been getting more defensive. Uh, we have taken our like long duration investment grade corporates down. We continue to move our high yield exposure down. We've been decidedly kind of muted and underweight on emerging markets. And we are, you know, quote unquote, uh, hiding out in uh, a short duration spread product uh, and, uh, and structure products. But I think the the ultimate trade here, the sequencing of the trade is long duration before your long risk assets. Uh, uh, and so the volatility makes it really difficult to pick your points. But 
to me, uh, the the duration trade is going to be uh, the best trade here. Greg, fascinating stuff. As always, buddy, thanks for being with us. Craig Peters there of PGM Fixed Income. Lisa, if there's a headline there, it's a pretty obvious one. The team at PGM think financial conditions have to worsen. Yeah, and that they're trying to get liquidity so that they can get ahead of that, and that when they do go back into risk, it's going to start with duration. It's not going to start with the idea that the, co um, the companies are getting into a better situation. Coming up in the next hour, Mike Faroli of JP Morgan, the chief U.S. economist, going into an important week for U.S. data and to hear from Chairman Powell once again. Futures up 6 tenths of 1%. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. A Russian missile attack on a shopping mall in central Ukraine has killed at least 18. Authorities say dozens more were wounded and more than 30 are still missing. A group of seven leaders meeting in Germany called the attack a war crime. In California, the state Senate has passed legislation that would allow the public to sue firearm manufacturers for harm caused by guns. The bill is designed to use industry standards to permit lawsuits, despite federal law which immunizes gun makers and dealers from civil liability. It's part of a package targeting gun violence that California Governor Gavin Newsom has promised to sign. NATO is set to label China a systemic challenge when it outlines its new policy guidelines this week. Bloomberg has also learned that the U.S.-led alliance will highlight Beijing's deepening partnership with Russia. Still, NATO won't go so far as to call China an adversary. And British socialite Ghislaine Maxwell finds out today if she will spend the rest of her life in prison. In Manhattan, a federal judge will sentence Maxwell on charges that she engaged in a scheme to lure and groom young girls for sexual abuse by former boyfriend Jeffrey Epstein. Prosecutors want a sentence of 30 to 55 years. Credit Suisse is seeking to emerge from two years of scandal and losses. The Swiss bank is promising to boost its business with rich clients and cut costs by simplifying technology. Credit Suisse plans to grow its wealth management unit by focusing on priority markets such as Hong Kong and Singapore. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. I do believe we have reached peak inflation. Mm. Inflation will start to come down as financial conditions tighten, as central banks normalize rates. But we're not going to get to 2% uh, without significant damage. Hildebrand there. Philip Hildebrand, the BlackRock vice chairman on peak inflation. I have to admit, year over year, I thought we'd done that a few months ago. And then we got last month's print, didn't we? So. Look out for that. Futures on the S&P up six tenths of one percent on the Nasdaq, up by a half of one percent. Yields on a ten year up four basis points, three twenty three ninety five. And my inbox full of emails about Al Albin because of Lisa's mention of it a little bit earlier this morning. Camping and hiking gear at Al Albin. What do you expect? I had no idea what it was. It sounded like coffee. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really good cup of L.L. Bean. Honestly, I, I think that it's important. We should all be outfitted in, you know, in camping gear. Camping gear in Jackson Hole. TK can't wait. We can't start wait the on. show right now awesome. to inform the lad of the lad. L.L. Bean. You go up to Freeport, Maine, John. The store's open 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And long ago and far away, you had not one, two, three. You had three set of some form of L.L. Bean boots in your college closet. And, John, I just think it screams, John. Lisa, help me out here. I mean, Pharaoh's got to wear the 16-inch L.L. Bean classic boots. I mean... They're expensive, they'll, Tom. They, well, they'll keep the snake bites away. Yeah, I was, like I was just looking of... at this Sunbuster folding shelter for $139. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, it's the amazing thing about U.S. broadcasting, Tom. You couldn't do this in the U.K. without saying there are other good stores to find your camping and shelter. Oh, really? Goods from. There's only one LLB. <laughs> Leon, Leon Wood Bean, 1912. And that's enough of an ad campaign for LLB. There we go. We're done. Uh, today. We'll get John. You, we'll get you the blanket, the Hudson Bay kind of 
L.L. Bean. Awesome. We're done except for her. Kamala Gupta's going in Texas. We don't wear L.L. Bean. She joins us uh, right now on retail. And this is on a sneaker company. It's on a sneakers company. And I should say we don't wear boots in Texas, but we do in Virginia, where I got a very rude awakening about how cold it can get in the Northeast. And, of course, L.L. Bean very coming in handy. Also coming in handy is Nike. And this is important when you talk about their earnings picture because, of course, we know the stocks across the board have taken quite a beating. But Nike's interesting in that it's taken a little bit of an extra beating. And a lot of that has to do with the China question, their China exposure really coming front and center in their earnings that they reported today, once again saying that their sales from China dropped about 20 percent in the last quarter. They're worried about the macro risk going forward. It's actually weighing on their entire full year forecast. And you can see where that's been reflected in the shares. So our radio audience, what you're looking at here for the chart of the day is Nike shares relative to the S&P 500. When the line goes up, Nike is outperforming the S&P 500. When the line goes down, it's underperforming. And so far, it has been underperforming the index year to date. And a lot of that is because of that Chinese exposure. If you go across the index to other companies, Starbucks, McDonald's that have similar kind of exposure to China, you'll see the same dynamic. Critty, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it. On retail, and particularly after what Goldman Sachs wrought over the last two, three days, John, help me here. Mr. Constant out with a note of gloom a couple days ago, and it's sell-side retail following on. I mean, there's no other way to put it, It's right? sort of a load of price target cuts <clears throat> from Goldman yeah. across a range of... A yeah. range of retailers yesterday, Tom. I think it was Walmart, Target, right. Restoration Hardware. Take your pick. We don't do buy, hold, sell at Bloomberg Intelligence. That's what we're acclaimed for. Poonam Goyal joins us now, not on the buy, the hold, the sell, but on the reality. And the reality, Poonam, is the inventory of Nike is up some 23%. Where do you put all those sneakers? I mean, do they have warehouses to the brim? Are they taking Amazon warehouses and using them to store uh, Michael Jordan sneakers that John wears every weekend? I don't think they have a warehousing problem with the sneakers. They don't take up that much room. Um, I think, though, the inventory is definitely higher than we would have expected because they didn't want to run out of sneakers, right, through the pandemic when they were having more severe supply chain hiccups. I'd be more concerned if the inventory was elevated on the apparel side than footwear. So if they have more footwear than apparel, I think the demand there is very, very strong. Um, the apparel inventory that's been overbuilt, that's where I'm a little more concerned because we do have continued weakness in China. And we also have sales flowing in North America. North America sales, which is their largest market, 40% of revenues, was down 5% in the quarter and missed consensus estimates. Poonam, how much have we priced in the margin compression that we're expecting to see? I mean, we're, I'm looking at the retailer index, the sub-index of the S&P, down nearly 30 percent so far this year. How much more do we have to go, given some of the uncertainty, the gloom that Goldman Sachs was highlighting, and the fact that they're dealing with margin compression, not just because of supply chain disruptions, but a more discretionary consumer? Yeah, I think we could have some severe margin compression in the second half. I mean, if you think about the inventory that's coming on board from the supply chain hiccups of the boats finally coming to the ports and into the stores and warehouses, the consumer demand for now is still pretty strong. But as inflation builds, as consumers begin to pull back spending, as they see their pocketbooks books and balance sheets shrink, you could have more inventory than what you're even contemplating today. And that's when you'll hit the vicious cycle of promotions across the board and uh, margins could be subject to further right. pressure. Not to remember, the second half is the, the largest part of the year. It's back to school and holidays. All right. Poonam, how do you clear inventory? Is it just price? You just mark it down and out it goes? That is the only way to clear inventory. You can liquidate it. You can mark it down. You can't burn it. That's not sustainable anymore. Helpful if you can move it too, Tom. And at the moment, a lot of this is all backed up. Big transit problems. Poonam, thank you. Transit pro I agree. Huge transit problems. Yeah, Poonam Gore there. I agree. Of Bloomberg. And Tom, I go a step further. Just for Nike, a bright spot. Direct to consumer has been really, really good. Well, and Really he, good results there. I, I, I don't really understand why that's not just going to continue to get stronger and stronger. Direct to consumer to me is, is, is the future. Maybe I'm wrong in it. I would point out, John, the Air Jordan 1 lows... They come in AC Milan colors. They, I mean, Tom? they're perfect for you. I'm not sure that's quite my style. I can tell yeah. you that Bramo's getting hammered, though, on that front. Because one really? of her youngest You're just tweaking quite me. likes those. Yeah. Well, he's into the whole resale market, and he's really excited. So he excited. buys them and oh, then he resells buys them. Well, and then he, resells he wants them. to do that. And so okay. he'll, like, you know, work on making sure that they don't get any creases and walk like, you know, he has wooden so legs. So he will wear them. 
occasionally and then he feels guilty. You know, I, I don't need to, to go them. into this. Yeah, exactly. No, I'm I trying mean, to work out what, what, what's the business model there. There's How much a whole, do they make? What's the markup? <laughs> there's, a, there's, there's a very big markup. And if you get a rare one, um, then it's well, an even can bigger you, markup. Lisa, can you get day best. trade to go into a pair of LL Bean boots? I mean, did you see him <laughs> doing that? You know, I think we're moving away from that right now. And I think that we're going to try to shift into other interests. Uh, what like? We could discuss that in the break. No, I'm just interested. No, I, because look, I wanted him to day trade. I know, a couple I know. Of you guys, ago. you guys want him to day trade, and at the same time, when your kid is watching, walking like he's got wooden peg legs, so he doesn't get creases in, and is figuring out how to iron with a wet cloth in order to get the uh, creases out. I mean, I guess it's taking care of things. It's good. It's good. Well, this is just good. It's this all is, good, John. This, this is, is all good. good. This is fascinating. This, this, is this, was, this was a better than good segment. <laughs> When do they go back to school? <laughs> That's right. what she's asking. <laughs> yeah, pretty you much. You don't get to take it back on live <laughs> TV and radio, Lisa. <laughs> up five or six tenths of 1% on the S&P this morning. On the Nasdaq 100, up a half of 1%. Yields a little bit higher, up four basis points to 323.76. China easing some quarantine rules for travel. I'm not sure how material that is, but crude apparently likes some of that. Up 1.5% on WTI at 111. 23 with Tom Keane, Elisa Abramitz, who's broke for the rest of the summer. <laughs> I'm Jonathan Ferro for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Every single major spike in inflation has been fixed with the recession. The question is, is it a big R or a small R? If that stimulus is lacking in this economy, anticipate a slower growth backdrop. As we go forward with more rate hikes and continued high inflation, it's going to slow. The question is, how much is it slow? All inflation is the same at this moment for the Fed. The bottom line for this rally that we're seeing is, unfortunately, I think we're going to see continued volatility. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keene, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Abramowitz, and Tom Keene. Thank you for joining us on Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television. All that's going on in Bavaria, in Madrid, the economic data, the market up 23 points. Guess what, John? Housing, Case Schiller, up 21% year over year. Is that the greatest distortion that we look at? How much damage do we need to do to get inflation back down? That's the number one question right now, Tom. With these central bankers absolutely determined to carry on doing what they've been doing, including Chairman Powell, President Lagarde set to jump into the mix. Governor Bailey, you'll hear from him tomorrow too. What we heard in the last hour from Greg Peters of PGM, mm -hmm. I thought was just fascinating, Tom. His view, financial conditions need to worsen. They need right. to worsen because this central bank can't tolerate an easing of financial conditions when they are so determined to get inflation down. We'll hear for some real caution from Alicia Levine here in a moment. John, I want to go back to Philip Hildenbrand earlier on Bloomberg, Jean Bovin, BlackRock, who he spoke to. And it's in the Lagarde comments that you mentioned uh, today with Francine Lacroix in Portugal. And, it, John, to me, it is this gravity of what do we need to do to wash out the huge fiscal stimulus, and the answer, conversation after conversation, is more pain. Go a step further, Tom. I think you're asking a more important question alongside that as well. Will they tolerate a higher level of inflation so they don't have to inflict so much pain on this economy? They're not going to share that with us now. That's part of the guesswork, I think, for the back end of this year into the next year. How much inflation will they be willing to tolerate? Right. And what does that mean for your call in this market? Lisa, do we see any crack in home prices? I guess I get a little bit of anecdote, including mortgages near 6%. But I'm sorry, we're, 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 we're so taken by all these details, we don't see housing up 21%. This goes to the underlying fundamentals of this market. We are not looking at a 2006 style housing market where there was a lot of leverage, fueling, flipping, and all sorts of speculative activity. These are home uh, buyers who want to live in homes and who have cash to put down and are not overly leveraged. That said, Tom, the bigger question in my mind is how long will it take before you see some sort of slowdown in the housing market before that trickles out into rents, which are still climbing at a record pace? In the market here, we're going to do a data check here. John, I'm just going to look at the good feeling of equities over the last four, five, six days while you were on sabbatical from 32 to a 26 handle, 26.97 on the VIX. Can a man not go on vacation anymore? It's a sabbatical. It's a vacation. Halls. What? what I, halls. You go, in England, you go on halls? Down. I'm just beating down. I'm so upset. Future's up halls. five tenths on the S&P. <laughs> 
on the Nasdaq up a half of 1%. This is going on holes. Yields up four basis points. Holes, Tom. You never called it holes? No. I use the word vacation and my family berates me for that now. Seriously? It's, it's a holiday, John. <laughs> Don't change. 324 on tens, Tom. That is funny. In the commodity market, one that eleven. If I say holiday here, no one understands me. It's like pavement versus We're, sidewalk. Oh, we're not that dense. You're a very confused lot. Oh, come on. Very confused. It's ridiculous. Eyeglasses. Can you imagine me on a two-week vacation? This is ridiculous. Waste paper basket. John, what not would I bin. do? What you would know? I do on a two-week vacation? What would you do, Tom? I, I, uh, no Given way. how this show's Get gone over the last couple of hours, it feels a bit like a vacation, Tom. You know, do. I, <laughs> I, I don't know. Let's John, Brent Crude, let's talk about it. 117.35, I'm sorry, there's a lift. 6.5% in oil. Yeah, China easing quarantine rules. Yeah. I think there's this belief that that's the direction of travel <clears throat> and things ease up from here even more and that Chinese demand picks up. Who was it? Jeff Yu of BMY Mellon that wrote into this show yesterday and talked about the lack of an impulse from China on the inflationary story of the last six months. Right. Maybe that could kick in could kick in in the back half of this year. The demand that a lot of people are talking about across the Pacific Rim. Right now, and this is an important conversation. She's head of equities, capital market advisory at BNY Mellon Wealth Management. Alicia Levine, always on the edge of enthusiasm. And I'm sorry, Alicia, buried in your note is the outlier what if, which is a multiple for the market out of another time and place. Can you actually multiple a gloom 12 times multiple on the market? Uh, that would be our extreme left tail risk, but it is out there as a very low risk scenario when it goes something like this. And it's similar to the conversation you've been having this morning, which is that, you know, earnings for the second quarter are expected to be up about four and a half percent. But for the second half of the year, earnings are still up on expectations, 10 and a half percent the second half, which I think is probably not believable. We expect margins must come down here. And the way that stimulus, uh, you know, increased the revenue side, it also increased the, the operating margin side. We're at record, record margins. That has to come down. So as earnings come down, the multiple will start looking higher if the market just stays where it is. And in a recessionary scenario, you could be down on earnings 10 to 30 percent. And with that, the multiple goes wow. with it. So I would say an average recession multiple is 14 times. Whatever those new earnings are, expect it to come down 7 to 10% from here. And then you put a, a, the, the average recession 14 times, you're about 3,400, about, as, as a first stop before we can think about moving higher here. So we're in the chart. I think the rally in the last week or so is an expectation that that PCE data that we're getting on Thursday is going to show some peak inflation. But once we've rallied six or seven or even 10 percent into it, then where do you go, even if it is slightly peaky? Alicia, that scenario you just painted, is that just a bearish scenario or is that your base case? That is not our base case. That is a, that is that is a bearish scenario. But you have to start thinking about well, if the worst case happens, where does it go? We actually think there's a 50-50 chance uh, of recession in the next 12 months. So there's that bumpy that bumpy landing, not really a soft one, but a bumpy landing, about 50% recession on the other side of that. But we do think the recession will be mild, meaning the job market is so strong and activity is pretty strong in the economy. We don't think we'll see anything deeper. The wild card, of course, is if there's some kind of contagion in financial markets. So if we get if we get a market dislocation event, of course, that could make it worse. But right now we're seeing this as a slowdown, an earnings slowdown, a mild recession and then something we can build out of here. But I agree with your previous guest that that tightening financial conditions is part of the Fed's solution to the inflation problem, which means, of course, the market will go lower as part of the plan. So which equities do you see as probably bearing the brunt of the pain? And I'm thinking in particular of Goldman's call on retailers that are facing perhaps extreme margin pressure in the face of uh, inventories and other factors that are much more volatile. Look, on the consumption side, on the consumer side, it's all about the inventory to sales ratio. If you think sales are moving lower, and then we know the inventory levels are up 30 to 50%. So the margins are going to come down 
pretty quickly and it'll hit earnings pretty quickly. So I would say that's pretty much ground zero to for where we see earnings revisions right here on that discretionary side. The stocks are acting like it. if you look at the staples versus uh, versus uh, discretionary, uh, you can see the vast outperformance on the staple side. So that's where you should see the, the, the multiple compression and the earnings compression first. And you'll see it in the second quarter earnings as well. Alicia, have we already reached uh, the point at which it's time to start selling out of the energy positions? The idea that we've already seen that wager kind of roll over and now people are more worried about recession and lack of demand. And so too, uh, will the stocks reflect that? So that's a great question. I mean, it's something we have to think about. We are bullish on energy stocks with WTI staying above 95. So on a technical level, over 95 means the energy stocks should probably still work here. We do think there's a structural issue. There's some cyclical component in the in the movement on the energy sector, but it's more structural. And as you've pointed out, Energy's managed to move this high with China, with one third of Chinese locked down. So, to the extent that there's any any demand from China coming out of a COVID lockdown situation, it should help support energy prices and therefore the stocks. You're probably not going to get that parabolic move. You know, we always talk about how parabolas don't make great technical charts, but we think it's too early to sell out here. Alicia Levine of BNY Mellon. Alicia, thank you. Some pain in some of those names last week. They bounced back just yesterday. I think the oil trade, the energy trade is so tricky into the back half. If you look at the Federal Reserve right now, they're targeting inflation expectations. And as we know, Tom, inflation expectations oh. are heavily influenced by what happens with energy. So ultimately, if you take that a couple of steps further, can you make the assessment that this Fed is targeting energy and demand destruction? I don't think you have to go that far to make that assessment. Do you conclude that they can achieve that? PCE deflator, 6.4% survey. PCE core deflator, John, 4.8% survey. The suits and ties and the fancy uh, dresses are taking out the agony people are facing. The f you know, this is serious stuff, John. There's some real, real agony out there when you look particularly at rental data and eviction data. This is really serious. And yet Bloomberg-type people wean it down to a 4% statistic, which seems palatable. It's not. Lisa, you don't have to look too far to find that pain. That's for sure. No, and that's the reason why I think that the retailers are so interesting, particularly the Walmarts and the Targets, because there are people who are making decisions based on how high gas prices are, what else they can afford, whether they're going to go out and make those extra uh, you know, clothing options uh, available to themselves. Honestly, these are all of the things that will give tea leaves into where the trajectory of this economy is going and how much pain is being felt. It's a big part of this program through the year so far. We'll continue to be through the rest of this year, I imagine. I fear that perhaps there's a story going into next year. For many people, let's hope that's not the case. China's been a big part of the story this morning, that's for sure. We'll catch up with Leland Miller, the CEO of China Beige Book International, in just a moment. Futures up a half of 1% from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rishika Gupta. A group of seven nations have agreed to stick by Ukraine to the bitter end. At the same time, they pledge to ratchet up the cost to Russia of its aggression. Still, they left much of the detail of how to do so unresolved. At the conclusion of their summit in Germany, leaders also told China to, quote, abstain from threats, coercion, intimidation measures or use of force. And China has made the biggest shift yet in its tough COVID zero policy. Quarantine times for inbound travelers has been reduced by half from 14 days to seven. That comes after Beijing and Shanghai. So they had no new locally transmitted COVID infections for the first time since February. The SEC has fined Ernst & Young $100 million in a cheating scandal involving the ethics portion of the certified public accountant exam. The agency also said the firm misled U.S. regulators probing the misconduct. It's the largest ever penalty for an audit firm. And last year, companies defied the coronavirus pandemic to go public at a record pace. Now market volatility, inflation and fears of a downturn have brought an abrupt end to the listing party. According to data compiled by Bloomberg, companies have raised a combined $4.9 billion via U.S. IPOs this year. That is less than 6% of that record sum raised in the first half of 2021. 
And Walgreens Boots Alliance says it has decided to keep its boots and number seven company businesses under its existing ownership. Boots is the largest drug sh store chain in the UK, according to Sky News. The reason is conditions in the debt markets that were hampering bidders' ability to make firm offers for Boots. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. The Boston Pops Fireworks Spectacular is back in Boston. And Bloomberg will make sure you don't miss a second of the fireworks, music, and special appearances by superstar Shaka Khan, Grammy and Tony winner Heather Headley, and the voice winner Javier Colon. Plus Middlesex Fife and Drum and the Tanglewood Festival Chorus. It all starts July 4th at 8 p.m. Eastern, right here on Bloomberg Television and Radio. As you're seeing central banks across the world hike rates to slow their economy down because of China's experiences with zero COVID and a much slower economic momentum, they're actually lowering rates. And that means that the carry advantage or the yield advantage that used to be in the case of the CNY uh, relative to other currencies is just no longer there. And so China's in a very different place. Kamak Shia, three thirty there of Goldman Sachs weighing in on China just yesterday. China, a big part of the story this morning. Good morning to you. Equity futures up a half of one percent. We all woke up a little bit earlier this morning on the East Coast to news out of China that they were easing the quarantine for travel. Does that open up a better demand picture? coming out of the world's second largest economy. We can talk about that in a moment. Yield tired by three basis points, three twenty three on tens, crude up by one point five percent, Tom. One eleven twenty on WTI. You know, the, 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 the movement here in the market, I, I'm going to call it sustained, John. I mean, the fact is, I mean, we gave way yesterday. What, did we ever understand why we gave way yesterday? Sometimes you can't explain every single yeah, tick, Tom. exactly. Some I, data I that was at Dallas Fed yesterday, some of the data points haven't been great. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't... PMIs last week, you know, ISM on Friday. I got some dollars stronger. I'm watching yen. It really hasn't moved. But again, and maybe as Alicia Levine said, folks, we're just focused on PCE uh, a, a couple days away. Right now on China, an incredibly important conversation. Please take notes. Leland Miller with us, Chief Executive Officer, China Beige Book International, and really wonderful granular data about China. Shanghai, 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 Shanghai. Leland, I'm worn out by it. If I get on the bullet train of, as I have and I go out of Shanghai, I go west to 5 million people, and I'm going to butcher the name Changzhou, which is an industrial town west of Shanghai. How is COVID in the places we're not focused on? Well, I actually think that's the biggest story of the second quarter. Now, we can talk about how things will get better now that lockdowns are easing and travel lock, you know, travel quarantines are easing, and that, and that certainly will happen going forward. But the biggest thing about the lockdowns was not that Shanghai was shut down or that a couple other big cities were shut down. It's that the secondary effects were much more significant that was reflected in the current conversation, certainly most data. So, you know, the second quarter numbers are actually much worse because of what was happening in April and May and, 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 and the secondary effects of those lockdowns and people have been admitting. So things will be improving, but you got to uh, improving off what? It, it, it was a lot worse than people were acknowledging, uh, than the government was acknowledging just uh, just weeks and months ago. And translate that, Leland, into the economic backdrop. I know you do a lot of granular data, taking a look at the on the ground picture. What are you looking at in terms of GDP growth in the second quarter, in terms of a full year expectation on the backs of that worse than expected data? Well, based on the weakness that we saw in April and May, the second quarter's numbers should contract. Uh, they will never announce a second quarter contraction. Lee Keqiang made that very, very clear in May when he said that, that, that they had an all-hands-on-deck effort to, to boost growth. They needed to get stable growth. And, and some, uh, some senior finance officials came out a few days ago and said, we will see reasonable growth for the second quarter, which means positive growth. So I, I think you know we have an internal bet. Uh, our, our chief economist and I have an internal bet on what they're going to hit. 
you know, my my number was was closer to 1.8. Our, our chief economist number was, uh, was 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 a little above two. So we think they're going to just throw this number on. It's not justified by the data, but I think that people are are embracing this idea of a June comeback, a June bounce back, uh, which which was not in the data, but they're embracing this narrative, and so they will accept a a number in the two percent range, which markets will get very very excited about if we see it. Well, Leland, when you talk about what markets get excited about, they get excited about the support that Chinese government officials will provide the market. And they've been able to do that perhaps more than some people had expected because of the lack of inflation that we've seen in the region. At what point does that shift, right? I mean, it's sort of uh, which side of the evil are you on? Do you have no consumer activity and no inflation or do you get a revival and then the same inflationary impulse that you're seeing in the rest of the world? Yeah, that's one of the most interesting stories coming out of our second quarter data because the Fed is looking at this and has to say, like, this, this, this is great news. And the reason it's great news is that you had this real threat that you would have surging inflation out of China, either because the supply uh, supply shocks shut down ports, shut down uh, uh, logistics, and would cause a, a you know a supply sur uh, supply shock uh, surge of inflation in the United States, or you'd have this wonderful bounce back in in, in June and in July and others demand back, and then you'd have surging commodity prices. Amazingly, it looks like. <laughs> they thread the needle between not being too much and not too little. So we're not seeing that surge of inflation mm -hmm. coming out of China just yet. Uh, but this could change very easily if things get much better in China, if things shut down again. So for right now, the Fed has to be very happy, but, but, but for just right now. Lee Lin, with all of your skills, your reading of the culture of China, what does the next Hong Kong look like? Well, I, I mean, are we talk about the future future of this Hong Kong. Uh, is, the future of this Hong Kong is is, is quite uh, quite dreary. I mean, this is a this is not this is just another Chinese city at this point. Uh, it's it's been uh, it's been sad to look at at, at uh, Hong Kong be what it once was and now become you know a, a secondary city of China that, that's. Uh, that's uh, pushed its expats out. It's pushed it because of the politics. What and should the Western down. banks do? Leland, you're advising Mr. Diamond, Mr. Moynihan, and the rest of them. What should Western banks do with the next Hong Kong? Well, they're pretending. They're pretending to. Uh, they're pretending to stay. But most of the people I know are actually moving through the back door out to Singapore already. So they want to make sure they're not offending the Chinese government by by moving in mass out of Hong Kong. But no one wants to be there. Between the between the national security law, between the COVID qu crackdowns and quarantines, uh, very little appetite for expats in particular to be at Hong Kong right now. And so uh, you're you're seeing an exodus. Um, e even if Hong Kong markets stay relatively important going forward, you're seeing a massive exodus of people. And it's no longer the financial capital it once was. Leland, thank you, sir. Leland Miller there of the China Beige Book International. Just as we were conducting that interview, having that conversation, I was just going through the estimates for Chinese growth this year. Mm. I don't think I can say I've ever seen so many forecasts with a three handle for Chinese economic right. growth. UBS, Morgan Stanley, Nomura, Barclays, Deutsche Bank, Natixis, Bank of America, BMO Capital, the list goes on and on, Tom. ING. Pantheon, AXA, JP Morgan, Danske Bank, Mizuho, BNP Paribas, TD Securities, just on and on. All of these banks looking for a three-handle. The median has a four-handle, just. But, Tom, that's the pitch for Chinese growth this year. It has changed in a material way over the last well, couple of years. People are looking for something we haven't seen in a long, long time. The run rate is 6%, let's say, and you're going to have it to 3%. And then what does that mean for the Pacific Rim, just for starters, uh, John? And that's why you see... Uh, the IMF and other institutions start to follow. I believe it's WTO with sub 3% global growth. That's a statistic no one, including Michael Faroli, has ever thought of. And a lot of people might consider that a global economic recession, eh, Tom? Absolutely. There's no question about that. Michael Faroli is going to join us next, the chief U.S. economist at JP Morgan, looking ahead to Chairman Powell tomorrow. Some ISM data, PCE data, a whole bunch of data coming up this week from New York. This is Bloomberg. Live from New York City this morning, good morning to you all on TV and radio. This is Bloomberg Surveillance and here is your price action. Equities elevated through most of this morning. We stay that way 
just up a quarter of 1%. The move fades in the last 10 minutes or so on the Nasdaq 100, up just about a tenth of 1%. Yields backing away from session highs as well, in and around 325 briefly, up by two or three basis points now to 323. In the commodity market, Tom, that fades too. 110 on WTI, up by a little more than 1%. <laughs> Let's get right to it here with a VIX 27.01. Michael Faroli is the chief U.S. economist at J.P. Morgan. The world stops at 7 p.m. on Fridays when he and his clan uh, release their weekly prospects. We get a lead on that into this week as well. Michael, how will your weekly prospects on Friday change with the anticipated PCE deflator statistics hours before? Yeah, we'll have to see what kind of data we get between now and Friday. Uh, you know, I think on the PCE number, a lot of that is already foreshadowed by the CPI uh, and the PPI. I'm perhaps a little more interested in seeing what we get in jobless claims than in the ISM report. I think there has been some signs that the economy is losing a little momentum. Some of those indicators have been, um, you know, a little more worrisome than others. So I, I'm going to want to see what the activity data <clears throat> Uh, we get uh, uh, Thursday and Friday, say. Is the character of a growth recession, not an outright NBE or gloom recession, but just to slow down the sluggishness that maybe you and Bruce Kasman are writing about, is that about a domestic economy flat on its back, or is that the international component folded into it? I think it's more about the domestic economy, but I, I would point out that the dollar, the real trade-weighted dollar is up pretty significantly, so we are going to be... Um, uh, uh, you know, essentially having some trouble, I think, with uh, external performance as well. Perhaps that's one reason why we are seeing some of these signs that the factory sector is now following uh, the housing sector lower. Uh, so I think it's going to be mostly uh, driven by Fed policy, uh, intended Fed policy, uh, but I think some of those effects will be felt uh, globally. But, you know, we'll have to see how much global gro growth also slows. Obviously, Europe is slowing here. Um, that's not going to help, but, but so far we're also expecting kind of a controlled descent in Europe. Michael, earlier in the show, Tom was talking about a really important point about the deceleration of inflation not being enough. And at what point does the Fed say, okay, we're good. We can allow things to remain a little bit hotter than they had been over the past decade in terms of inflation and not raise rates to the point where we know that we're going to torpedo the economy. Michael, do you believe that that impulse is on this Fed or that they really are committed to getting things back down to 2 percent inflation over the near term? I think they are committed to getting inflation 2 percent, maybe not in the near term, but in the medium term. Uh, and I think in my, in my mind, one of the big debates right now or big uncertainties is the Fed has been talking about uh, uh, essentially taking an outcome-based approach uh, to fighting inflation, which is to keep raising rates until inflation gets you know, close to 2%. Uh, that would be a change from past, uh, past procedure where they were more forecast-based. So if they were, normally you would think if you saw the unemployment rate rise and payrolls decline, then you would wait for the effects to follow through in spending and in prices. Uh, so I think that, you know, that's a big debate right now is whether if we do see further weakening in activity, is that enough to get them to dial down the pace of rate hikes, or are they going to just keep going until we get back down to 2%? Michael, I tend to think they'll be a little more forecast-based. So based on uh, what we're hearing and based on the discussion about the R word that we had last week that seems to have faded a little bit with this consensus for a softish landing, what are you seeing in terms of a recession probability, not with respect to a downturn or some sort of technical definition, but in terms of the nature of how prolonged that downturn could be? So uh, it's not our, our baseline scenario, but it is obviously very elevated. Uh, we don't think it would be a very severe recession. Certainly, there aren't the cut types of imbalances we had uh, in 2008. Uh, so we don't think it would be a severe one. But it could be a long one, particularly if in that recession, the Fed once again is pinned at the zero lower bound, in which case they wouldn't be able to provide a lot of stimulus to generate a speedy recovery. So I think it, it should be uh, a shallow recession, but it could be um, you know, a bit longer than, than normal. How does the dollar break? Everyone has been, you know, not everyone. We got to be careful here, Michael. But how do we? How does the dollar give way? The resilient dollar has been a lonely and very successful call. How does mm -hmm. it actually give way? I think, I think the simplest way would be for the Fed to feel a little more comfortable that they are achieving their goals and that they don't have to be quite as uh, aggressive in raising rates. I think that would be the simplest way you could get uh, the dollar to well, cool off here. 
Okay, I, I need a single point estimate, Michael, because no one's, you know, it's just you and me. Uh, but, but if the inflation trend comes down from 8 9%, where's the kink in the glide path where the Fed changes its dialogue? Is it at 5%? Is it at 4%? There's got to be a point where they yeah. shift the rhetoric. So I would tend to think of it more in uh, sequential terms. I think if monthly, uh, you know, core CPI numbers come in under three tenths, then I think they can. Okay, uh, interesting. Yeah, yeah I think they can dial down. We speak with Michael Faroli of J.P. Morgan as we head toward earnings, particularly kicking off with the big banks. And Michael, I've been noticing that capital markets have been slowing down in a very dramatic fashion. We've seen certainly uh, financial market conditions tighten, but you can see in the IPO market, which is just a fraction of what it was last year, you could see it in the high yield debt market, just a fraction of what was last year. How much is that going to pose some sort of credit issue that does get the attention of the broader market in a new way? How much do you see signs? of that being a risk? So you're, you're obviously seeing slow down capital market activity, but we're not yet seeing any elevated signs of credit risk that would suggest uh, a problem there. So I think I'd want to distinguish the activity from the actual um, credit risk. Obviously, if, uh, you know, if the economy does slow sharper than expected, then we have to revisit that, uh, that, that um, conclusion. But, but right now it looks... Uh, I don't know. I'd say flashing yellow. So given the sense that people think that the credit markets will hold in and they have held in despite some of the tightening because a lot of companies have extended the maturities, does that mean you could see much worse financial markets performance than the underlying economy? Because the Fed tightening is aiming for reducing some of the froth from that market, but that it might not trickle into the real economy so quickly based on how much of the financing has already been uh, held in place and based on the fact that a lot of people are, are removed from that activity in some sort of direct way? So look, I think we got to keep in mind that there are several channels of monetary policy transmission, and I think in each cycle, uh, some are more potent than others. I think we've already talked about one, uh, which is the dollar, which I think will be feeding through into, uh, into the real economy. I think we're starting to see that also feed through into weaker import prices. I think we're seeing the mortgage rate effect already having a pretty pronounced uh, effect on um, uh, on housing activity. So we got to keep in mind it's not just one channel through which, uh, through which monetary policy operates. I do think we're seeing, uh, and of course some of the wealth effect too, uh, since the beginning of the year. So I do think that there are definitely real channels that are still operating. Uh, and I think you're starting to see the, I guess call it the fruits of that in slower uh, economic activity. A bit Mike. of tasting fruit, that's for yeah. sure. Mike, we've got to leave it there. Michael Frody there of JP Morgan. Mike, wonderful to catch up, sir. Thank you very much. Just getting some headlines from Jake Sullivan, Lisa, the National Security Advisor, mm -hmm. to this president. We've talked a lot this morning about maybe some contradictory goals, some objectives over the next couple of days for G7 leaders. On the one hand, at the G7, they're exploring these oil price caps on Russian crude. On the other hand, they're set to label China, what was it, Lisa, a systemic... A systemic what? A threat? Systemic yeah. challenge? Systemic challenge. I'll get the exact uh, wording sure. just to make sure. But this has been an issue and a complete about face of prior communique because they haven't really mentioned China. But sort of parsing out what you've pointed out, which is the really important trading partnership that they have with China, and I'm talking about they being all NATO countries, but also how do you not poke the bear too much at a time where you're trying to sort of get them to come along with you? And how do you introduce an oil price cap on Russia yeah. if you enter? antagonize China, which you need to be part of that effort, otherwise it just doesn't really work. What we're hearing from Jake Sullivan, and this is why this is worth mentioning, is that they've started discussions with India on price caps. That's exactly. something Anne Marie mentioned a little bit earlier this morning, Tom. You need to get India on board, you need to get China on board. It's a big, big effort. I, that's where I wanted to go, John, is all of this is futile because of India. I mean, there's a triangulation here. It's always been that way. I mean, it's been that way back to I'm not going to say World War II, but certainly back 30, 40 years, you try to go China, Russia, Russia, China, China, Russia, and then you've got the elephant in the southern room in India. It's, it's more complex. It's highly complex. And Lisa, yeah. for that matter, I think a lot of people doubt the likelihood <clears throat> that the G7 can come up with something that in practice will actually work and be effective.
Yeah, just to highlight how complicated things are, Jake Sullivan also talking about the tariffs. Remember the tariffs from the Trump era sure. that were put on Chinese goods? There's they, been a lot of discussion now? about removing some of those tariffs in order to alleviate some of the price pressures since they basically increase the prices for the end consumers in the United States. So how do you send a message? What message are you sending on one hand if you want to, for the own benefit of the U.S. consumers, remove those tariffs, but you also want to send yeah. a message? It, it, it becomes very complicated. At least it's beyond complicated. You want to call them a systemic challenge at the NATO level. At home, you've accused them of genocide. And at the same time, you're going to remove some of those tariffs because you're facing domestic pressure politically because inflation is too high. Tom, foreign policy has become a big, big issue, and they've had to backtrack on several issues on the foreign policy front on the international stage because of domestic inflationary pressures. Exactly. China, one. Russia, that's the one they're committed to. I'd throw in Saudi as another one that they might have to backtrack on in the coming month, Tom. The adults that I listen to, John, are talking about the military expanse of the United States of America to reaffirm what we're doing in the Western Pacific. I thought Robert Hormatz was brilliant on this, I'm going to say, uh, two months ago. What's the plan to reaffirm showing the flag in the Western Pacific? That goes against all these headlines uh, you know, easy to fix headlines about Russia. Yeah, I'll reaffirm China. this. We're in the cheap seats. This is a really difficult job. Really, yeah. really difficult Absolutely. job. This is highly complex stuff. Futures up a third of 1% on the S&P. Yields high by three or four basis points. Your yield on a 10 year, 323.57. Bob Doll of Crossmark joining us at the opening bell on Bloomberg TV. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. NATO is set to label China a systemic challenge when it outlines its new policy guidelines this week. Bloomberg's also learned that the U.S.-led alliance will highlight Beijing's deepening partnership with Russia. Still, NATO won't go as far as to call China an adversary. A Russian missile attack on a shopping mall in central Ukraine has killed at least 18. Authorities say dozens more were wounded and more than 30 are still missing. A group of seven leaders meeting in Germany called the attack a war crime. And British socialite Ghislaine Maxwell finds out today if she will spend the rest of her life in prison. In Manhattan, a federal judge will sentence Maxwell on charges that she engaged in a scheme to lure and groom young girls for sexual abuse by former boyfriend Jeffrey Epstein. Prosecutors want a sentence of 30 to 55 years. And the push by Goldman Sachs into consumer business hasn't been cheap. Bloomberg's learned the firm's internal projections show losses from the business accelerating to more than $1.2 billion this year. The losses stem from the addition of new business lines, pandemic effects and higher expenses. Plus, new accounting rules will force Goldman to set aside more money as loan volumes grow. And Credit Suisse is seeking to emerge from two years of scandal and losses as well. The Swiss bank is promising to boost its business with rich clients and cut costs by simplifying technology. Credit Suisse plans to grow its wealth management unit by focusing on priority markets such as Hong Kong and Singapore. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. I think institutions need to be very prudent, focusing on liquidity, dry powder. It's a time to protect capital, not to shoot the lights out, to get some great return. Right now we're in, um, you know, I do think we're going into a recession and that's a totally different playbook. Paula Valente, she is the giant of Bowdoin up in Maine and she has moved to Rockefeller University as chief investment officer after early years at Yale University under the late great Mr. Swenson. David Rubenstein in conversation with Paula Valent. This is a really, really important conversation for endowment and institutional at Wall Street. David, this is a woman with a track record second to none in investment management. Trace the trail from Yale to the Stunning brilliance at Bowdoin, and now to the challenges of Rockefeller University. Well, Paula was trained as an art uh, conservator 
and she basically was in art conservation. She decided to go to Yale uh, Business School, Yale School of Management. And while there, she did an internship for David Swenson, who was running mm -hmm. the Yale Endowment. She uh, was really liked by him. She helped write his um, outstanding book on portfolio management. And then she got a job at Bowdoin, where she managed the endowment. And at Bowdoin, the last uh, 10 years there, she outperformed the Ivy League in every single um, category in terms of return of every other Ivy League manager, including David Swenson. Um, and she did a spectacular job in the 20 years she, she was at, at, at Bowdoin. And, and Bowdoin, her chief, uh, uh, the chairman of her investment committee was Stan Druckenmiller. So she's been a kind of a protege of both David Swenson mm -hmm. and Stan Druckenmiller. What's interesting here, David, is the backdrop is the worst bond market that you and I have ever seen. It's been one of my missions of the last 90 days to go, hello, everyone, down 12 percent, maybe down 18 percent. How do people like her and how is she at Rockefeller University adapting to yield up price down? Well, she's very cautious. Her view is we're probably heading into a recession and her view is you don't try to... Uh, uh, knock out the lights by going for super returns and, and getting the high-flying tech uh, kind of companies. That's not what she does. She's protecting her downside, and I think she's a very cautious investor. Remember, over the last 10 years, she outperformed every single Ivy League uh, endowment. And last year alone, before she left Bowdoin, she had an, an internal rate of return of over 50 percent for, for the last year she was managing Bowdoin's endowment. So uh, she's quite impressive, and uh, Rockefeller has done very well to get her to be the chief investment officer. David, one of the big uh, distinctions for endowments where people have been seeing outperformance has been their use of private markets, their use of alternative capital. How has she folded that into the call of a traditional 60-40 to get that kind of internal rate of return? Well, of course, the, the Swenson approach or the so-called portfolio approach is to use a lot of uh, private investments, and she did that as well. Uh, the trick she had was that getting into these best funds, because Bowdoin wasn't as famous as some other organizations or universities, and so she had to talk her way into some of the best funds. Inevitably, uh, the marks will come down for some of the uh, venture funds, and probably, therefore, uh, she and some of the other Ivy League endowments won't have the, as good a return uh, this year as they had last year. On the other hand, uh, her returns are so good, it's not likely to go down all that much, uh, in my view. How much is she actively trading into a time of such uncertainty versus having a long-term view post-recession that she sees right. and sort of uh, sticking to her guns on it? Uh, my view is that she doesn't think she should try to uh, knock out the lights by going for uh, things at the absolute bottom of the market. She's very cautious, conserving some cash. Um, she's in some very good funds now, but now she's remaking the Rockefeller portfolio because she inherited it uh, from somebody else, but who was very good as well. But she's remaking the portfolio into something that uh, is more comfortable for her. Tell us about Rockefeller University. This is not the normal school. I think of David Baltimore and my youth and right. what he did with mRNA and virology onto the miracle of what Pfizer and Moderna uh, did as well. It's not right. Bowdoin, is it? No. It's not Duke, is it? They no. don't have a basketball team, do they? I don't think Rockefeller <laughs> has a basketball team that I know of, but uh, it's in New York City on the east side. It basically is an organization that does medical research and, and health-related research. research. Right. Yeah. And it's a high, uh, highly intensive place. A lot of Nobel Prize winners have been there and are there. Um, it's a highly specialized organization, and it depends to some extent on its endowment because uh, the Rockefeller family is not now putting in a lot of more money. So the endowment is very important to that organization. Mm -hmm. David, given the fact that you work in the private markets and you talk to these investors all the time, perhaps, uh, you know, big and small, how much do you get the sense that they are following in the same kind of path uh, as, as what we heard uh, just now? Well, everyone is recognizing that the market is down, it, whether it's a bear market, a recession, or whatever you want to call it. It's obviously down from, from the peaks, and people are debating how much longer it's going to be down before it goes back up. People who are very cautious are basically not trying to, to uh, uh, set records right now. They're kind of seeing where the market's going. But there are some people who see there are great values in the market, and the so-called value investors are now seeing that we're touching near the bottom in their view, and they're going back into the market. So I don't really think the market is likely to go down that much further from where we are. And I think the, the, there's enough cash on the sidelines to go back into the market and keep the prices of some of these stocks uh, at reasonable levels. But uh, we're, we're a long way away from being out of the woods, in my view. Uh, David Rubenstein, thank you so much for joining us. And of course, this is an important conversation. 
been critical for anyone within institutional Wall Street and the endowment world. Paula Valent, Bloomberg Wealth, uh, look for that, uh, of Rockefeller University, 9 p.m. Uh, tonight. Lisa, I, I think the, the deception here is that the Bloomberg terminal is asleep. It is not. There are some really interesting nuances here with a 10-year yield out to 3.25 percent. And what I'm really focused on, Lisa, is yen struggling to go weak yen and maybe breach out into new weakness. What we're seeing right now is a lack of certainty played out in markets. And what it, it, the nudginess that you talk about all the time is interesting and important, especially in light of some of the weak liquidity in certain <clears throat> markets. The lack of certainty, how do you trade around this? What are you even trading on? Is it just the University of Michigan no. sentiment? survey or is it every single Dallas Fed survey, et cetera? Case Schiller here coming out, folks. You're going to look for that, I believe, at 9 o'clock. Yes, 9 o'clock. And what's interesting, that's dated material. Uh, we're going to get the April statistic on Case Schiller. But, uh, Lisa, again, housing up 21 percent far beyond what we witnessed in 2006 and into 2007. Yeah, and even if there is a cooling down in housing prices, it's going to take a long time for the transmission mechanism to find its way into right. rents that are not climbing at such a rapid pace. Yeah, we'll have to see. Futures up 15, Dow futures up 143, and the VIX, one of the positive stories here in the quiet, from 32 down to 26.90. Please stay with us on radio, on television. This is Bloomberg.